Kevin in the back videotaping this because we're live streaming this and we're really, really happy that so far we have eight people online watching tonight too. So, so we're excited by that. Uh, and, and we hope that if you can't make it to one of our appreciation nights in the future, you will be interested in joining us live and online because we'd love to have you that way. However we can reach out, reach out to you and send you information, we want to do that. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, let's just start quickly. Oops, we skipped over that. There we go. Uh, thanking IDEX. IDEX has graciously sponsored the dinner for you tonight. Um, we're very appreciative of IDEX for doing that, as I'm sure are you, after a long day to have a nice dinner. Uh, I don't know much about laboratory anything, um, but I do know about imaging equipment. I do know they have some nice imaging equipment, so I'll put in a plug for that <laughs> for them. I also want to take just a brief minute to introduce our team. Um, most of our team is here tonight, so I think hopefully many of you know me, Dr. Nykamp, um, formerly the chief of radiology. I have given up that title, um, somewhat saddenly, but somewhat happy to, um, to move on to become the associate dean clinical program, so basically the hospital director. So if you have questions or concerns at the hospital, you're welcome to come find me. I'm happy to chat. We've got Dr. Zerlinden here, who I, I'm so grateful is here. Um, he is our most recent addition to the radiology service. He's a wonderful addition to our service. So we've got Dr. Zerlinden. We've got Dr. Lisa Melville visiting us from Australia. Um, many, many years in practice. Great experience. Wonderful person to work with. She's filling in for me in radiology, so we're thrilled to have her with us again tonight. We've got uh, Cyrielle Fink, who's our first year resident. Wave, Cyrielle. Thank you. <laughs> and Sean McKenzie, our second year resident. Third year. Um, Third year resident, sorry, I keep forgetting that. I want him to stay forever, so I'm going <laughs> to just take him back a year. <laughs> so um, they're going to help, and what we're going to do as we go through some of the cases is we're going to kind of mingle around and help you get going with some thinking about some of the cases so that you're not so afraid to necessarily jump in and give us your opinion. Maybe none of you are afraid and you're going to jump in and give us your opinion on all of them anyway, so that would be fantastic. Uh, and then not here tonight is Dr. Chalmers. She's in Saskatoon, I believe, right now, so she couldn't make it back for the night. Also, you'll see up there our technical staff. We're really fortunate here to have quite a strong and wonderful technical staff, and we appreciate all the work that they do for us. Uh, for those of you that are online, this is how you reach us. So just in case you're out there and you want to tweet in a question, they will be coming to me. I will relay your questions, and I will make sure that they get answered by our team. Oh, gee, we're, now we've decided to just go at random our presentation. Um, so if you're online and you want to log on, this is all the information. I think Jane's given me everything I need to know, right? Just making sure that she doesn't tell me I need to add something else. Okay. Uh, and so, welcome to our vet team appreciation round. Oh, one last very special thank you is to those clinics who did graciously respond to my email request and send us some radiographs to discuss tonight, without whom we would have nothing to do tonight, <laughs> except have a nice dinner. <laughs> Take it away, Dr. All right, thank you. Whoa. <laughs> that is very loud. Right there? No, where is the volume control for this? On the, which one? Mm. <laughs> Give me a second here. There's no volume control there. It has on and off. It's hmm. good. Everybody, oh wait, that's on it. Mm. Move it further away. What if I put it really <laughs> low down on my shirt? <laughs> Too low? Can anybody hear? Everybody still hear me? Okay. Normally my voice only travels like two or three rows, so let me know if you can't hear me at the back. Okay, so welcome. Um, the plan for tonight, uh, I was going to give a very brief kind of review of radiographic uh, interpretation, hopefully very brief, 10, 15 minutes, a little refresher for some. Um, hopefully it's nothing really new. Um, if you have any questions, obviously stick your hand up and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, and following this little brief review, we're going to start into the cases that uh, were submitted. There's six cases that we submitted, or that were submitted. Um, I was going to have you guys kind of discuss amongst yourselves, so kind of small groups, uh, for about five minutes, look at the radiographs. Um, I'll post them or I'll show the images on the screen as well for each case that we're talking about because um, the paper copies probably won't do it justice for a lot of the cases. Um, have you guys talk amongst yourselves. Um, the radiologists and the, uh, our residents will circulate around and see if you guys have any questions. You can ask them 
Um, and then after the five minutes, we'll get together as a group and go over each of the cases, come up with any thoughts, uh, plans, etc. If you submitted the case um, and you have the answer, um, obviously don't tell us until the very end. If you have any questions or you want to provide your insights on the case, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, we encourage that, of course. Any questions before I get started? All right. So I'm going to touch briefly on the basis of radiographic interpretation and the Rankin signs. So this is all radiograph interpretation is about. It's all about the Rankin signs. So what we're assessing is the size, the shape, the opacity, the location, the number, and the margination of everything on the radiograph. Um, not the easiest to do all the time. Um, one important thing that you really have to know is normal anatomy, not just normal anatomy, but individual variation. And there's a lot of variation in our patients, dogs of all different sizes, all their vertebral bodies are going to have different sizes, etc. Um, one thing that I find often gets overlooked um, in the Rankin signs is the opacity. So opacity is very important, often gets skipped when we provide some sort of description of the radiographs. So um, I have five basic shapes here. These were all taken from radiographs. So starting from the darkest on the radiograph, um, on the left side, air, obviously going to be the darkest. The brightest is going to be metal or contrast medium, so barium, iodine. In the middle, we have water and soft tissue. Um, going to have kind of a grayish appearance. Fat is going to be between air and water and soft tissue. And then our bone, uh, bone opacity, obviously lighter than our metal and our contrast, but it's more dense than our water and soft tissue. And again, why is it water and soft tissue? Well, they have the same density. So they're going to have the same opacity. So if you have a water soft tissue opacity, you can't necessarily differentiate whether that's free fluid or a solid organ. Questions on that before we move on? That's basically all radiographic interpretation comes down to is assessing the Rankin signs of essentially everything. So how do we go about assessing everything in a systematic process? Well, that's, that's a little bit trickier. Um, you guys individually need to come up with some sort of way to assess radiographs and hopefully you have some sort of methodology. Um, they don't have to all be the same methodology for every um, type of anatomy you're looking at. So I use uh, one type of approach to look at a thorax, another type of approach to look at an abdomen, and another type to look at musculoskeletal. Um, they can all be the same, but they don't have to be. So I'm just going to go through a couple, or obviously four, different approaches that you can use to go through a systematic approach and uh, discuss that a little bit. So starting off with the thorax. So when you have a radiograph, you want to try and evaluate, obviously, everything on the radiograph. Now, when we take a thoracic radiograph, we're obviously interested in the heart and the lungs predominantly. So when I start looking at the thorax, I say, well, let's forget about the heart and the lungs. We're going to come back to that. Let's look at everything else. So start on the periphery. Make sure we're not missing anything. So for the thorax, I use either a spiral or a clockwise approach. So I start on the outside. I either start dorsally or I start ventrally often ventrally by the sternum, looking at all the sternebral bodies. Um, and what I'm assessing in each of those sternebral bodies is all of the Rankin signs. Is the shape normal? Is the size normal? Is the opacity normal? Does it have a bone opacity? Or does it have a radiolucent center and there's a lytic process going on? Um, location, is it subluxated? Um, number, um, and margination, so are the margins nice and smooth? So that type of thing. So the sternobray, um, often on your thoracic radiographs, you'll have the forelimbs. So what you can see of the elbow, of the humeri, of the shoulder joints, of the scapula, again, assessing all your Rankin signs. Um, and this shouldn't take too long to do, sort of a brief glance, but you definitely want to note in your mind that you're looking at a certain feature. So you want to tell yourself that you're looking at the sternobray, that you're looking at the elbow joint, you're looking at the humeri, the shoulder joint, the scapulae. Um, so moving up, 
to the cervical spine. So how much of the cervical spine do we have? I'll often start with the bones, so looking at the cervical vertebrae. Again, assessing all the Rankin signs. Some of them, since you're not looking, you're not performing cervical radiographs, the neck's not going to be very straight. You may not, to be, you may not uh, be able to assess them very well. Uh, going on to the thoracic vertebrae, the spinous processes, can you see all of them? Do they have a bone opacity? Or are some of them missing? Is there a lytic neoplasm in one of your spinous processes? And again, your vertebral bodies, is there a normal intervertebral disc space between every uh, thoracic vertebrae? Or do you have some lytic lucent region of one of your end plates and your patient actually has discospondylitis um, that you might just happen to pick up on a thoracic radiograph? So after the dorsal portion of the radiograph here, I come down to the cranial abdomen, and you'll often have a fair amount, um, fair amount of the cranial abdomen, depending on how much you collimate your radiograph. So you can sometimes assess the size of the liver, see where your stomach is positioned. Is your stomach enlarged? What kind of material does your stomach contain? Is there any mineralization in your liver, in your gallbladder? That type of thing. Um, so I've basically done a full circle here, and I haven't assessed anything of the heart and the lungs, which is good, but I've assessed everything on the periphery. And then I move in, and I assess, and kind of spiral in from there. So assess the periphery of the lungs. So we're looking for small little pulmonary nodules. Um, they're going to show up easiest or best in the periphery of the lung field on the outside here. Um, so trying to differentiate small soft tissue opaque pulmonary nodules. Um, from, say, a uh, pulmonary blood vessel um, is very important. Knowing that the size limitations um, of pulmonary nodules, so soft tissue opaque pulmonary nodules will only show up on thoracic radiographs if they're four to five millimeters in diameter. Anything smaller than that, so if you have a three millimeter or two millimeter pulmonary nodule, it's not going to be a soft tissue opacity. If you're seeing it, it has to have a mineral opacity. So that's going to make it a pulmonary osteoma, something benign. So size is very important um, for pulmonary nodules. Got a little bit off track there. Circle around. Um, in your lung field, you're going to assess your pulmonary blood vessels, your pulmonary vasculature. Um, is the size normal? Are they linear? Are they tortuous? Are they blunted? Um, should be able to see your aorta coming up dorsally off of your cardiac silhouette. Um, should be able to see your caudal vena cava quite well. Um, and then coming down into the middle into your cardiac silhouette. Is it normal in size? Is it normal in shape? Um, if you want to do the vertebral heart score, you can do a vertebral heart score. Things like that. So that's kind of a lateral radiograph interpretation. Very similar approach to the a dorsal ventral or ventral dorsal thoracic projection. Basically the same thing, making sure that you see and look for every particular thing. Um, a lot of dogs will get hit by a car, present to you, you want to look for rib fractures. Um, so you want to carefully evaluate every rib. One trick that may or may not help, if you turn the radiograph upside down and assess the ribs in an unusual, um, or assess the radiograph in an uh, unnatural, I guess, approach or unusual approach. So you can actually really focus in on those ribs um, as they go upside down, but you'll really get a clear look and see if any of those ribs are actually fractured. So that's kind of my spiral or clockwise approach that I personally use for the thorax. There's an organ checklist you can also use. Um, this could apply to the thorax as well. So all bony structures, kind of a broad category. You have to remember to look at every bone, so you could have thoracic vertebral bodies, humeri, scapulae, ribs, um, then your cranial abdomen, your liver, your stomach, then your heart, lungs, pulmonary vasculature, trachea, esophagus, lymph nodes. That might be an organ type approach. Um, you might jump around a little bit more, um, but that might work for you. It's not a big deal. Quadrant approach. Talk to and I'll talk about that in a second. And a disease checklist doesn't really work too well with the thorax because you're going to get a lot of diseases that you would have to go down your checklist on. So we'll come to that in a second here. Just before you leave that, I think the trick about the turning the radiograph for the ribs is is actually really key. 
Um, I know, and some of it is knowing your own weaknesses. So what are the things that you tend to miss? And I always share the story that in my right LG board exam, I had this study and I looked at it and I said, you know what, I pulled the films down, I was all done. And I said, yeah, but if I'm gonna miss anything, it's a rib lesion. So I put them back up real quick and said, let's just double check those ribs because I don't think I actually looked at them. And sure enough, there was a big tumor on the rib that I had completely missed because I hadn't looked at it. I think these approaches are wonderful and I think that probably in the end you will use some combination of all of them. I will not lie, I, do I never lie. I, I use all of them and probably I should pick one but I can't um, because I'm so used to multitasking and having so many things that I honestly can't look at a radiograph that has a big obvious lesion and ignore that and look at everything else. I can't do it. it does, it's not in my nature to do that and that's fair. I think you can look at the big obvious lesion and work your way through that. The key is to always go back to this systematic approach. If that's what you have to do to answer that, go back to it because that's where I see the errors. I see the errors when people don't go back to that systematic approach and they miss something else that would have changed the plan dramatically because they weren't thorough in going back. So, Thank Sorry, you. Alex. No, that's good. <laughs> okay, so moving on to the abdomen. Um, you can still use a spiral or clockwise approach. Um, Again, obviously it's the same thing. I won't, same thing, I won't go through this in as much detail. Make sure you cover the bones, the, the pelvis, looking for fractures, looking for lytic lesions, looking for bone growths, um, the femurs, ventral abdominal body wall. If he's hit by a car, make sure there's uh, no avulsion of the prepubic tendon or thickening of the soft tissues here. Um, you can see some of the ribs, the caudal thoracic ribs here. And then I'll often start back at the liver, um, sometimes the stomach. <clears throat> I often leave the stomach and GI tract till the very end. So I'll do liver, kidneys, dorsally, kidneys in retroperitoneal space. Do we have fluid in the retroperitoneal space? Can we see the kidneys? If we can't see the kidneys, why not? There's probably fluid in there. Um, kidneys, urinary bladder, spleen, and then I go back to the GI tract, which Maybe that's why the dog presented, cat, vomiting, inappetence, something like that. Start with the stomach, and then always go back to the Rankin signs. Is this a normal size for the stomach? And you may need a little bit of clinical history as well, which hopefully you would have. We don't always necessarily have the clinical history, um, but you guys should. So did, so you have a vomiting, or you have a dog. Did he just drink a, a lot of water recently, or did he just eat a recent meal? Well, then his stomach can be quite large if he just ate. If you have a vomiting, anorexic cat that hasn't eaten anything in five days, his stomach should be really empty and really small. So just by having anything in that stomach is gonna be abnormal, um, by having that little bit of history in there. So the size of the stomach can vary based on what you know about the patient. So I'll often start at the stomach, uh, make my way um, down from there, basically in a systematic approach. Can I see the duodenum? You don't always see it, but if it's filled with gas, you can see the duodenum. Um, you often won't be able to, to connect the duodenum to the jejunum, to the ileum, to the colon, um, but you can often see the start of the duodenum or duodenum, however you prefer to say it. And you should be able to follow the colon from uh, the rectum or the descending colon so I'll often start at the stomach and the proximal duodenum and then say, okay, well, everything else is going to be small bowel and large bowel. And then I go back to the colon and I say, okay, can I trace out exactly where that colon is? So where is this feces and gas in the colon? Trace that all the way back. A little bit more challenging on a lateral view since your transverse and ascending colon are going to be superimposed with each other, but a little bit easier on a ventral dorsal view because your colon should give you a nice question mark shape. Now, it's not always going to have gas in it. It's not always going to have feces in it, so it can be a little challenging. Um, but if you can trace out the entire colon, and you know where the stomach is, everything else on your radiograph that's tubular in shape and has <coughs> gas in it has to be the small bowel. So if it's too big, if it has a foreign body in it, and you've already traced out the colon and gotten that off your checklist, then it has to be in the small bowel, and that definitely helps narrow down your differential list. If you can't see your colon, um, and you really can't differentiate if that's a dilated small intestinal loop or a normal segment of colon, um, you can do a pneumocolonogram. Fairly straightforward, fairly easy, fairly cheap. Uh, I recommend it to all my students when they leave here. Um, their uh, confidence level isn't the highest, and they, 
I see them that they really have challenges differentiating the small bowel from the large bowel, so I tell them to just perform a pneumocolonogram. All it is is taking a red rubber catheter, inserting it not too far, five to 10 centimeters into the rectum, and with a little bit of lube, in, uh, injecting about one to three mils per kilogram of air, and you're gonna be more on the three mils per kilogram of air. Um, injecting that slowly, not against any pressure. If you uh, identify any resistance at all, stop. You can potentially perforate that colon. Um, hasn't happened to me yet. Um, the syringe goes in nice and smoothly and the air fills up that entire colon. I take one, potentially, well, often two radiographs, but the radiograph that I have in question is that large bowel, is that small bowel, I take that one. If it was a VD, great, I retake that VD. I should be able to see that nice question mark shape of the large bowel. And that questioned bowel loop that I had, is that now gone because I filled that entire colon with gas? Or is that separate from that question mark shaped colon, which has to make it the small bowel? So you'll have your answer. You'll have a dilated small intestinal loop. You need to do something else, whether it's go to surgery or, or what. Dr. Verlinden, do you sedate when you do that? Or can you do it with them awake? You can do it with them awake. Um, they may appreciate it a little bit more if they're sedated. Um, I wouldn't suggest trying it in a cat, obviously. <laughs> um, but I have tried it in awake dogs and sedated dogs. Completely anesthetized dogs, too, is probably the easiest, but not always the most practical. But yes, never in a cat. Good luck with that, if you do. <laughs> so spiral, clockwise. Okay, so an organ checklist also works for the abdomen, works better, I think, in my mind. So you can use a spiral approach, you can use an organ checklist. There's a finite number of organs that you can actually see on a radiograph, so your list is gonna be fairly short. Obviously your bones, your liver, your spleen, your kidneys, <coughs> excuse me, um, your urinary bladder, your stomach, your small bowel, your large bowel. It's basically all you should normally see. Then you also have to have that list in the back of your head of organs that you shouldn't normally see, but you could potentially see if they're enlarged. So uterus, adrenal glands, lymph nodes, a pancreas. Well, you can sometimes see a pancreas in a normal patient. Any questions on that? <clears throat> and that normal patient that you could sometimes see the pancreas in would be? A cat. A fat cat. A fat cat. <laughs> so lots of, so basically, contrast is your friend. So the more, so obviously a fat opacity adjacent to a soft tissue opacity, such as a pancreas, um, is going to allow you to vis visualize a pancreas. Um, if you don't have a very, um, if you ha don't have a patient with a lot of intra-abdominal fat, then your detail is gonna be reduced. Uh, quadrant approach also works for the abdomen. So on a lateral projection, I'll divide up, um, divide up the, obviously the abdomen into four sections. Quadrant one will be the uh, dorsal, craniodorsal quadrant. Quadrant two will be the caudal dorsal. And we have a craniovental and a cranial, sorry, caudoventral and a craniovental quadrant as well. And so with those quadrant approaches, you just need to know what organs arise or live in which quadrant. So if you have a mass, um, say you have a large soft tissue opaque mass in quadrant one, well, what organs live in the craniodorsal abdomen. Could be the liver, could be the right kidney, potentially the left kidney, where it, where, uh, depending on the animal. Uh, potentially it's arising from the stomach. Your adrenal glands also live in that location, so it could be arising from any of those structures. Um, but it, you know, it just depends on the location of where that is. So quadrant approach, disease checklist, Again, too many diseases in the abdomen for you to actually go through a disease checklist. So that moves me on to the last type of radiographic study or broad category, which would be orthopedics or limbs, et cetera. So this is where I will employ a disease checklist and more so in large animal uh, radiology, but it also works for small animals, same type of thing. 
This is where you're radiographing one joint or one long bone, something like that. Um, so we have, I have an el elbow in this example. So what are some diseases of the elbow? So we have elbow dysplasia, and you can divide those up into an united ankyneal process, um, medial coronoid disease, a fragmented medial coronoid process, <clears throat> osteochondrosis, um, an united ankyneal process. There's a couple little things um, under that broad category of elbow, elbow dysplasia. You can have osteoarthritis, so a degenerative process, fractures of the humerus, just uh, proximal ulna, radius, um, lytic lesions, so tumors, fractures I talked about, um, if he's a young dog, panosteitis. So your lists are for your orthopedic conditions are often limited, and you're looking for characteristic lesions. So for osteochondrosis, not a good example, I don't have a cranial caudal projection. Well, let's go with an, an ununited ankyneal process. Well, we can see that he has a nice, smooth, smoothly margined ankyneal process. There's no new bone. There's no lucent fracture line or lucent line separating the ankyneal process from the rest of the ulna. So we can check that off our list. He does not, this dog does not have an ununited ankyneal process. And you can go down your list of diseases, checking off or crossing off each condition until you arise at you know, you narrow it down to one, if you're lucky, two or three differential diagnoses, and that, that may help. Um, so that's, those are kind of the approaches that I use. Obviously, Dr. Nykamp is gonna be different. The other team, the other members are gonna be different. Um, some people will read a radiograph from the top down, regardless of what they're looking at, right to left, left to right. This is spiral everything, doesn't really matter. If you have a limb proximal to distal, it doesn't really matter how you do it. As long as you evaluate the entire radiograph, you evaluate everything that you took on that radiograph, that's really the, the most important part. I think the, um, the, I like the idea behind the disease checklist, for, particularly for musculoskeletal as well, but I think the other is if you read the textbook and you, the purest of, like a pure radiologist would, would really, should never do a disease checklist, right? You should read the radiograph for what's there and then interpret that appropriately. That's the goal, and the goal being to do that without the history so you don't bring in the bias of the history. But the reality is there are certain things that if you don't say, this could happen in this animal and you don't look for them, you will never find them. So you do need to have some of that disease checklist for, for any of those regions that says, if I don't look explicitly for this, I may not pick that up because it will be a subtle change. So I think that's, particularly in the orthopedics, really important to think about. And the last, second to last slide I have here is well, why do we do, why do we take radiographs? What are they telling us? So it's not the, we, we might like to think it's the BL and N test, but it's obviously not. And we, we recognize that it only tells you, it's only one piece of the puzzle. It doesn't tell you everything. Um, if you're looking for your answer, well, this radiograph is hopefully going to help you. Um, and it might rule off a lot of things on your differential list but it might not give you the one answer that your client is looking for. <clears throat> so it can tell you the presence of a disease. If something is there, does it look like he has pneumonia in his lungs? It's a cranioventral distribution in his right middle lung lobe. It looks like pneumonia. Is that a diagnosis or is that your primary differential? So I wouldn't have that as my diagnosis, but you still want to have differentials. So an alveolar pattern in your right middle lung lobe, um, if your dog isn't febrile, well, is, are there other differentials for that? Pus in your, in your lung lobe is going to look exactly the same as hemorrhage in your lung lobe, um, in your lung on a radiograph. So you need to know what your differentials are for a certain uh, radiographic pattern. So radiographs are very good at, can be very good at localizing the disease, so where is an abnormality? What type of lesion is it? Is it mineralization? Is it soft tissue? Um, is it a gas type lesion? Extent of the lesion, how big is it, obviously? How small is it? And we'll hopefully provide you with a list of differentials like I just talked about, um, or potential differential diagnoses. And the goal of it, so you obviously want to come up with the correct diagnosis, but the radiograph should help you direct which test is next. 
So sometimes the radiograph might be all you need. So we have an alveolar pattern in the right middle lung lobe. Your dog is febrile, he's coughing, he's probably got pneumonia. Rule, you, want, you obviously want to rule out, like, why did he start vomiting in the first place? But you probably initially aren't going to do any more diagnostic tests. You're going to treat him with antibiotics. He's either going to get better or he's not. If he doesn't get better, or, or if he does, you want to take radiographs, reassess, make sure it's going away. If it doesn't go away, then you have to go back to your differential list. Did I have this correct? Is it actually pneumonia or is it something else? Is there actually an underlying pulmonary mass that was sitting in that location and it's surrounded by hemorrhage, but it looked like pneumonia, something like that? Or were the antibiotics he was on not appropriate? It is still pneumonia. It's getting worse. We need to stick a needle in it, find out what it is, do a, a, a matricular wash, see if we can get something growing there, something like that. Um, and like number four, it says like in a case of pneumonia, so you're going to document either improvement or is a conditioning worsening. So these are somewhat um, some of our limitations that uh, radiology imposes on us. Okay, any questions on that? Kind of my hopefully brief, short, not as short. As it we don't been. really like to admit that we have limitations, just so you know, that's very painful for us. <laughs> But um, I, think, uh, I think as we go through some of these cases, and thank you again so much for, for giving us the ones that we had to just spend an hour and a bit discussing because a couple of them stumped us, or at least made us think pretty hard, you'll see that sometimes you don't get to the answer, right? Sometimes, and I think that's what's frustrating. And I think, again, in the experience of radiographs that I've been sent over the years that people say, can you help me? I'm stuck. More often than not, it's because you don't want to call it normal when it's really normal because you took it for a reason you took it because they were sick and you expected it to give you an answer. So keep in mind that sometimes the answer of normal is a really good one. And I harp on this with our students all the time, that normal is exciting. And so if you go to your physician with a headache and you have an MRI, you really don't want him to come back to you and say, I'm really sorry, that was normal. <laughs> right? You want him to go, that's fantastic, it's normal. You want to prep your clients for that. So I think that's where a lot of the challenges come, is that it's normal. And sometimes the next one is, that it's not specific enough. It's not specific enough. Musculoskeletal is probably the one difference. We didn't get any musculoskeletal radiographs. That's because often it is more specific. You go, it's broken. It's arthritic. Okay, I know what to do. We get a lot of thorax radiographs. We get a lot of abdomen radiographs because you go, they're vomiting. I have no idea what to do, right? And so it's because these are not specific and because there's some limitations that I think these are the kinds of cases that you guys tend to end. So that's what we're going to try to focus on. Can you pull up both of them? Yes, I can. I don't know how to do that on Sorry, your I'm also technical support. <laughs> okay, so the plan for tonight, um, we're going to pull up each case at a time. So we're going to go over case one first. Um, we're going to give you guys about five minutes to look at the radiographs, compare them to what you have printed here. Um, if we can, because some of them have multiple images from different dates, we'll try and I'll let you know what date we're looking at, maybe do a couple minutes at a time. Uh, discuss with your neighbors, see if you can come up with any thoughts on the case. Um, I'll open the floor to each individual group or individuals if they'd like to give their thoughts on the case and then we can kind of work through the case in a systematic process, see if we can come up with some differential lists, what the next plan would be for each case. Um, and then if we're lucky, if we have any answers for the cases, uh, speak up if you know the answer. <coughs> technical difficulties, so. So it wasn't just me opening up the cases. That's good. <coughs> so case one is, well, maybe I'll wait in case no, we can't ahead. pull up case one. No, we'll, we'll pull up something. I, I can <laughs> ad lib anything. Well, I was going to read the history on case one. Oh, you have it? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so case one is a, f obviously it's right in front of you, a 14-year-old spade female cocker spaniel, suddenly developed separation anxiety, started urinating in the house as well as his own bed, decrease in appetite, mild muscle, mass atrophy. So we have a right lateral, a left lateral, and a ventral dorsal projection. <laughs> okay, we finally have both images up, so hopefully that'll help. Might be a little bit different from what you have on your papers. We'll give you guys just a couple minutes. 
Okay, okay it's been about five pick minutes. The quiet, I picked the quiet group. Approximately. <laughs> Does anyone, anybody want to take a stab at this? With some initial comments or thoughts on what they see on this study? Don't have to talk too much about any normal findings, but does anything look abnormal on this setting? Let's start with that question. Don't all talk at the same time. It's very rowdy in here if you do that. I'll start. Okay, yes. Go for it. So Okay, so the small bowel are displaced caudally here, um, both views, excellent. Is there something that's displacing those caudally? <laughs> and what, what is it? Or, so some sort of mass effect. Um, is there any other descriptors we can use to help further define what this mass is? Don't forget, size, shape, opacity, location, margin, right? Do we know that this is for sure all the stomach? So the stomach oftentimes will have fairly, homog well, fairly homogenous content. So if you have two compartments, you have the fundus and say the pyloric antrum, they're oftentimes going to have similar features, oftentimes. So they'll have the same amount of ingesta or fluid. So this guy here, left cranial abdomen, butts the liver and the diaphragm. This looks like somewhat normal ingesta sitting within the, in the stomach. And so the normal stomach should be positioned horizontally across the abdomen in the dog. And I don't really see anything over here to suggest that the normal stomach is over there. But we do have another gas bubble caudal to that. But there isn't a nice, well-defined wall. And I'm not saying this is all stomach wall, so some of that can still be fluid. But looking at the opacity of this, so we have a heterogeneous soft tissue fluid and gas opacity, whereas this gas bubble here is more of just a gas opacity. So it looks just like a gas bubble. Um, so that may or may not help, but that's only looking at one projection. So trying to figure out where on the other, on your orthogonal projection, where is that gas bubble? Anybody see it on this lateral view? Dead center. Excellent. Yes. So this little triangular shaped gas bubble here, or teardrop shape, or whatever you want to make it. And so really identifying where your stomach is on both projections can help, may help you determine where this abnormal gas bubble is. So looking at the lateral view, this is our entire stomach here. It's a lateral projection. We should have ingesta sitting in the gastric fundus, and you're not really going to be able to see your pyloric antrum too well. The second gas bubble is in the middle of the abdomen, and it's caudal to the stomach. So whereas on this view, it looks like it can clearly be, you know, you can have a malpositioned stomach if you have a large hepatic mass. But taking the two views together, this looks like a gas bubble caudal to the stomach. So what, where could that gas bubble be? Or what could it be in? So we have a mass, some sort of mass. Somebody called it a soft tissue opacity at some point. So predominantly soft tissue opacity. Don't forget what goes along with a soft tissue opacity is a fluid opacity. So soft tissue fluid opacity. And if you want to try and different or find those margins, it's going to be, well, where is it creating that mass effect and displacing all that small bowel around it? So this is going to be approximately the size of our mass on this lateral projection with a near central gas opacity. So you have to remember the patient is on his side place the patient on the side, gas is going to rise to the top. What is the top of a patient on his side? That's going to be the middle of his abdomen. Okay? So we have what I'm going to call, well, a soft tissue fluid opaque mass with a central 
gas lucency, which, act, which is actually going to be a gas cap, if you will. So we're taking our lateral radiograph is shooting through the gas cap in the middle and then into our soft tissue fluid opacity. So then the question is, well, the next question obviously, can you see that mass, the rest of that mass on the ventral dorsal projection? Because it's not just going to be that little gas bubble. So we're going to have sort of a larger mass effect. Now I, I lied a little bit. This mass doesn't completely, isn't completely just a soft tissue fluid opacity with a gas cap. It has another opacity in it. And you may not be able to see this too well from the back or from your printed paper. But there are little punctate opacities. Now if we're seeing these punctate opacities in a soft tissue fluid opacity, that means that they have to be a mineral opacity. If they were a soft tissue fluid opacity, they would just um, silhouette with the mass and you wouldn't be able to see them as distinct and separate. Okay? So we have these punctate mineral opacities sitting somewhere in this soft tissue fluid opaque mass with a central gas cap. So that's pretty good for our description. Any other abnormalities that anybody picked up? I was going to start it off with a little bit of spondylosis along his lumbar vertebrae, a little bit of new bone formation, not an uncommon finding in an older dog. It's hard to visualize the body at all. Okay. So bladder should be back here. I'd say it's going to be in this region here. So you just have to look carefully for the margin of that bladder. So my so, question would be, how do you interpret that? That's where I didn't see where that question came from, but I got it this way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's one explanation for why you don't see it well. What else? Okay, so maybe there's too much summation of small intestinal gas or other structures that just it, it's partially maybe silhouetting with the margins, so you don't see them well. What else? It's empty. It's empty. Right? All of those are very legitimate reasons. And so there's lots of times. One of my pet peeves with our students and our residents sometimes is when they describe the normal bladder. And I'm like, it's normal. And the normal bladder is of a normal size. And I'm like, I don't know what a normal size is because if they just peed before they came in, it'll be small. And if they haven't peed all day, it'll be big, but it still could be normal. So always, you know, I agree, I don't see it particularly well. It's sometimes hard to see, and I, my first thought would be, if there's good detail everywhere else, it's probably because it's empty. You know, it's probably small. And then I go, hmm, I hope I don't need to do a cysto. Because <laughs> I probably can't hit that. So. Other abnormalities anybody see? So if we're worried about potentially loss of serosal detail because we can't see our bladder, we're worried about free fluid. Is there any other evidence of free fluid in this case? So I would say no in this case. So we're looking at the serosal border. We're looking, in order to see the serosal border, you need to have fat on the outside. You need to have that contrast between fat and soft tissue. So here I can see our caudal ventral margin of our liver. We have soft tissue on one side. We have a fat opacity on the other. It's not a soft tissue fluid opacity. It's not a wispy or hazy soft tissue fluid opacity. It's a nice, normal fat opacity. So there is no fluid, or at least no radiographic evidence of fluid, um, immediately in this location, at least ventrally here. Um, and then going around in the small intestines. So when there's gas in the small intestines, what you're seeing, that contrast you're seeing, is your mucosal surface, or your, your mucosal detail. So, which is going to be your inner wall. So we have lots of gas, and then we have a thin mucosal layer. So that's going to be normal, obviously, but we don't really care too much about the mucosal surface. In this case, we're looking for the outer surface of that serosa. So is there fat on the outside of that serosa, or is there fluid? And so looking at a bunch of different small intestinal wall layers, I'd say we can see the outside layer. We can differentiate a soft tissue opaque wall from mesenteric fat. So I'd say we have good serosal detail, so there's no um, significant volume of peritoneal effusion. 
Now, even so, if say we were to ultrasound or open the dog up, you might find a little bit more effusion than normal, but it's going to be minimal, and you just won't be able to detect a small volume on radiographs. So, I might ask the question, because if you guys aren't going to ask the question, I'm going to ask it for you, because I'm going to ask the question that I think is probably on at least some people's minds, which is, in the middle of the abdomen here, I might have argued that there was decreased arousal detail, because I don't see the arousal margins very well. So, how do we explain that? I'm good at feeding him the question. <laughs> how do we explain that, Dr. Melinda? Oh, you're asking me specifically? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> They don't want to ask that question, but I know That's somebody fine. out there is That's thinking fine. <laughs> So, well, we know we have some sort of mass effect. Um, and true, we don't see any margins or serosal margins in this region. But where is our serosal margin going to be? If it is one solid mass effect, it's going to be at the edge of that. Um, so we're not actually going to see any serosal detail in a region of a mass, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? I see a few, con few confused looks. So to have serosal detail, you have to have a serosal margin, period, right? So if it's a big, solid lesion, there isn't a serosal margin in, in the middle of that. Therefore, there's no edge to have detail around. So that's the reason why, yes, you could absolutely describe that as a focal loss of serosal detail. But when you use focal loss of detail and mass effect in the same region, then that should lead you down that path of mass, thinking that it's a mass. And the reason mm. there's a loss of detail might just be that there's a mass pushing all the margins, right? So there's no margin right there. It could be a focal loss of detail around, for example, a splenic mass might be in that location. And there might be a true focal loss of detail there because the splenic mass bled into the surrounding mesentery, and that might obscure it. So both could be happening. But when you have something, when you think there's a mass effect, and in that area of that mass effect, there's no detail, consider that it could just be because it's displacing all those serosal margins out of the way. Hence, no detail. Can you tell how much mass there is attached to the uh, lumen of an overworking That's an excellent question. Well, that's kind of the next step is then, so we, we've described this, we've described our characteristics of our mass, and now we move to, so when I, when I have a mass, Instead of going straight to differentials, I go to what is an organ of origin? Where is this coming from before I move on to the differentials? So what are some potential? Sorry, there's a question. Yes, question. Sorry, before you, you move on, I want yes. to So on the, on the blue region, um, there's that loss of serosal detail there. But it's also where the abdomen might be the most wide. So Correct. Right. So the question is, um, it, uh, on the VD, it appears to we have. Uh, it appears that we have a loss of serosal detail, um, and that also is the thickest part of the abdomen. So are we going to um, adjust our settings to better penetrate that portion of the abdomen to look for that detail? Is that what you're getting at? So I'd say, sure, we do have that loss of serosal detail here. But looking at the rest of the cranial abdomen, the thickest part, I'd still say we do have some serosal, you know, whatever, whatever this gas bubble is in, I can still see an outer margin here. So I can still see good serosal detail in the thickest part of the abdomen. So I'd say that the technique is still good here. Even going into the thorax, I can still see some lung markings and some blood vessels. And we're shooting through air, not soft tissue. Well, sorry, that's kind of. That makes sense. Where there's air contact with detail Right. Right. So if we don't have a lot of fat in here, but we have some other soft tissue fluid opaque mass, that's going to give the appearance of a loss of serosal detail. But that fits more with this mass effect um, than an actual technique abnormality or technique problem. But I, I think it's a good question because Again, I, I've seen over the years lots of challenges that people have in, in my classmates. So he knows I had the same challenges too. But you know, one of them is, how do you know your technique is good? We get lots of radiographs where the technique isn't as good as it could be or is very good if people just interpret it as being poor technique instead of disease. So when you look at something like the thorax or abdomen, well, you want to make sure when you're judging your technique is that you're never judging it based on the things in the abdomen, because that's what could be wrong. 
judge it based on the spine. So can you see the vertebrae? Can you make out the spinous processes superimposed on the vertebrae on that BD? If you can see the spinous process superimposed and you can make out that there are disc spaces there, then the technique is appropriate. So the rest of it is related to more disease process. Whereas if you try to rely on the, the thorax itself or the abdomen itself, and I've seen it, I've seen one, I mean, an incredibly intelligent medicine resident who in my residency was taking radiographs, didn't know anything about radiographic techniques. So one, he wasn't adjusting it sufficiently, and two, he was looking at abnormally white lungs and trying to make it darker and darker, and that's never going to go away. <laughs> I don't know whether he was just being really hopeful, but it's never going to get better when you do that. So keeping that in mind when you look at it, I think it's a good question. Other questions? All right, so moving on to organ of origin. So we have some sort of soft tissue fluid opaque mass with gas in it in the cranial mid-abdomen just caudal to the stomach. So where could this mass be arising from? What are some, some things? What do you guys think? So the spleen potentially. So we can see a little bit of the spleen ventrally here, but we don't see a nice clear separation, so potentially the spleen. That's a very good thought on that. Yes, I do like that. Um, with one exception, how, well, how could we get gas in the spleen in a mass? So an abscess. So you can't rule out an abscess quite yet, but my, the top of my differential list, I would put some sort of GI. So since we have that much gas in it, um, I would put GI top on my list. Lower on the list would be something else that has an abscess. So it could be spleen. What else lives in that region? What do you guys think of the liver? Yes or no on the liver? I'll take no, Dr. DeLinden. Stephanie says no on the liver. Why? So what's the liver? mass or liver abscess going to change to our anatomy in this patient? Most of the time, right. So our gastric axis is going to be shifted caudally. However, could still potentially be the liver. You have a pedunculated liver mass. So you can have a thin stalk coming off the liver and you get a mass on one side. So that's a possibility. It's a differential. I, I would rank. agree with that, except for that location. I'm going to argue with them because you know, that's True. what we do here. I'd like to discuss because it's very, very left-sided, and pedunculated masses there, you don't tend to see that. I see a lot of them be caudal to the stomach because they sneak around the right side of the stomach, but not so much towards the left. So I would, for, for that reason alone, put that much lower for me. But I agree. Pedunculated masses can fool you. It's possible, but lower. Yeah. There was one other sign that I mentioned. So I mentioned that there was mineral potential mineral. Yeah, it's a little bit too far caudal. So your gallbladder should be up here. Um, so let's say based on location, probably not the gallbladder. Pancreas. I like that location. I had a pancreatic abscess. No, I had a, never mind. <laughs> I was going to give away a differential. Um, talk about that in a second. Another abscess today in a cat. Um, potentially the pancreas, because their body of the pancreas is going to live in this region here. Your left limb comes off to the side, and your right limb comes down here, kind of in the location of the pancreas. And again, there's a gas cap in it, so it would more likely be a pancreatic abscess than something else. Excellent. So a mesenteric, either a lymph node or, so that was the cat, that was the answer I had in my cat. I had a cat with a mesenteric abscess. Couldn't figure out where it was coming from. It just happened to be in the mesentery. Um, that was today. But these mineral opacities. Kidney? Um, kidney, on this lateral view, it's pretty ventral here. Um, can you guys see normal kidneys? Can we rule out kidneys? On either view? Let's 
say I can see one kidney up here. That's going to be the left kidney. And the right kidney is going to be cranial to that. That's where it should be. I'm not saying I see it. That's where it should be. On the VD view, um, I think that's the left kidney there. And the right kidney, I'm not sure if I see it yet. Um, that's pretty big for an adrenal gland and pretty ventral. They do mineralize, though, neoplastic adrenal glands. So there's maybe two differentials I have for mineralization. So if you have mineralization in, in a mass, it could just be dystrophic mineralization, and it's forming because your tissues are turning neoplastic into generating. What if you have, what am I going to ask? Has anybody heard of the gravel sign? Don't use it too often, but it comes up every now and then. The gravel sign is when you have mineral, kind of small ovoid mineral opaque features that kind of look like feces, but you see them in the small bowel, not the large bowel. And that's due to undigestible food that's basically been sitting there for a while. And why has it been sitting there? Because it's just proximal to an obstruction. So it's, char it's a characteristic sign that we see with a small intestinal obstruction. So potentially having these mineral opacities could be showing us that this is some sort of small bowel obstruction. Now it's quite a, quite a large mass and he does have feces in his colon. Most of his small bowel has gas in it. Um, but in order to have feces in your colon, you have to be passing something through there. So it's probably a partial obstruction. Um, what else? This is about the time that I go back to the history now. <laughs> so I, I'll look at it and say, wow, there's a lot of different things that this could be. Right? We've come up with a really good list, and I think, again, the important thing on that list is the things that you don't normally see, like pancreas. You don't see pancreas on most radiographs, but you know where it is, and you better remember where it is, or you won't think about the possibility of a pancreatic abscess in a case like this. So then I go back to the history, and I say, I wonder if the history is going to help me at all to prioritize, because the radiographs, that is the radiographs. That is what it is. It's that list of things, and probably going to keep us moving, but, <laughs> but, but probably I would throw out a list of things like, for any mass, right, hematoma, abscess, granuloma, neoplasia, right, that's the list of things for masses. I'd go, great, so now I've got to figure out what to do. I have to tell the clinician who came down, or I've got to tell the owner what to do, so I look back, and hopefully you then know why you took the radiographs, and in this particular case, if we recall that history, um, suddenly developed separation anxiety, started urinating in the house, as well as in own bed, decreased appetite, mild muscle atrophy, and I went, well, that didn't help. Because <laughs> I wanted, like, vomiting, you know, <laughs> not eating at all, not just decreased appetite. I wanted a really sick dog here to really go, oh, yeah, that's clearly GI. Because this didn't go, well, that's clearly GI. Although a lot of these signs, I think, were leading us to the discussion, the gas, the gravel sign, that sort of mineral, that this is probably GI in origin. That history didn't help me. So then I have to look back, and I have to think, okay, what do I trust? Do I trust the history? Do I trust what I'm seeing? Do I trust my physical exam? Do I trust the radiographs? Well, I trust the radiographs. You probably trust your physical exam. <laughs> I have not done a physical exam in 10 years. I don't trust that. <laughs> so I trust what I see that says, I still think this is probably GI in origin. And I think that's kind of where we came to. So then what would you do next? That's your list of things. You've got to make a decision. This client is still in the waiting room. The lovely clinic who sent this to me didn't tell me what's happening with the dog now. but. <laughs> So potential abscess, potential mass, obstructive, potential, uh, obstructive small bowel mass, probably not a foreign body, older dog, it's quite a large mass, most foreign bodies don't get this large. So what are some options that we could do? What would you offer? Okay, we could explore. Exploratory, perfect. Should Who's going to explore this dog? Give you your answer. Nobody wants to explore the dog. <laughs> Dr. Pease, you're standing on your own there. <laughs> ultrasound, I heard. Who's going to ultrasound the dog? And you all have ultrasounds, right? No. So, <laughs> so you're going to send it for an ultrasound? Is that what I get? 
Okay, you can do Excellent. contrast study. Yeah. A barium study, yep. I like those three. Those are good choices. Three choices. So who, because GI is on that list, right? So we, we think, because there's gas in it, we've got to consider GI. There is a decreased appetite. Who is comfortable, who has an ultrasound machine to do an ultrasound of the intestinal tract? <laughs> One. Excellent. <laughs> that, I mean, out of all of the things that you might scan, that can be the trickiest, because it's hard sometimes to follow the loops of intestine. And you might find the mass, if there's a mass, without a big problem, but then connecting it to organs is sometimes challenging. And that's why many people would choose to do a contrast study. So what if you do a contrast study? I always pose these questions to the students, so you may as well be on the hot seat tonight. What if you do a contrast study and it shows that, yes, in fact, he has a partial obstruction? So we're happy now that it's GI. He's got a partial obstruction. Are you worried that you gave contrast, and now you want to go to your exploratory and take it out? Who's worried about that? OK, why are you worried about that? This is when I get to pull my sarcastic card out of the surgery bag, because I'm not a surgeon either. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> the answer that I usually get to that question is, I'm worried because if I give contrast and then I go to surgery and I spill the barium in the abdomen, barium in the abdomen, they told me that was really bad. They told me that was a really terrible thing. And my answer is always, if you spilled the barium in the abdomen, you spilled the GI contents in the abdomen, you're a lousy surgeon, don't do that surgery. <laughs> it's quite simple. Because <laughs> you're not supposed to spill anything. <laughs> That is my answer. I know it's very sarcastic, but that is my answer. If the barium gets you to the answer of going to surgery faster, give the barium. Just don't spill it, because you're not supposed to spill anything. <laughs> so, so I really think it's underutilized in a general practice for those who are not comfortable with ultrasound of GI. Barium can often get you to that answer quite quickly, and I think that's very valuable. Or I love the what, colono, pneumocolonogram. I never Perfect. do them, but I think it's a great <laughs> idea. I just never did it until Dr. Zulinen came. But uh, you know, that's another way, again, to rule out large intestine versus small intestine, help you get to that answer faster, help you get to surgery faster, help you get home to your family faster. All of those things are important, right? But even looking at your differential list, most of the things on the list are pretty bad. So an exploratory laparotomy might get your answer a lot faster than any of those other tests if that's what the owners are looking for. And I think this is where the, a lot of that other challenge comes in, especially when we're trying to teach people about radiology, is because this is the point in the decision where it's no longer entirely in your hands. You have ideas of what you want to do, but you have a client on the other end of that who is paying a bill. And so it, some of it is their decision, and it's your job to educate them about the pros and cons of referral for an ultrasound, waiting three days. Whenever I ask for an abdominal ultrasound, I ask, can that animal wait three days? From the sounds of this history, he probably could have waited three days, right? Because that's the time it might take you to get a referral or to get somebody to your clinic or assume your ultrasound machine is broken. That's what I always tell the students because they rely on that and it's, you don't have to rely on that. So if you can't wait three days, you've got to do something else. So you either explore, you do a GI series, you know. But again, the client might say, I have to know what it is before I put them down. Or they might be very comfortable to say, well, he's not really doing well and you think that it's a mass and no matter what, I'm not going to touch a mass. I don't want anything to do with that. I've been through that with my family. I've been through that with my other pets. Whatever the situation is and they're done and that's okay. But that's when you guys get really scared. It's when I get really scared too, I'm not going to lie. Because when I know that what I just said without any additional diagnostics is going to result in an animal being euthanized, I start to second guess my decision. Just like everybody else does, right? You want to be sure when you do that. But I think you could be pretty sure on these radiographs that nothing good is going to come of that, right? So if that's the ultimate decision of that client, then that's okay. And, and again, that's where the confidence comes in that says, yep, I'm, it's good enough. I have enough information. And that's what we do with imaging, is try to get enough information to be comfortable with whatever the next step's going to be for us. And sometimes we don't have enough, and we say, I can't, no way, I need that ultrasound. So. so just to repeat that for the camera, no significant changes on blood work. Um, dog did start vomiting after. Uh, the radiographs or after the initial visit did go on with pain meds to survive another couple months but was then euthanized and no postmortem so we don't know exactly what this was. Okay, thank you. So case number two is a 10 year old neutered male German short hair pointer has an episode of sporadic pain around Christmas time. Now and I know whose cases these are. So. <laughs> 
Unsure if GI related or back pain, blood work results unremarkable, increase in weight. So we have two right laterals, two left laterals. And when we're done, we are dying to know the answer for this one because we had a long debate. <laughs> two ventral dorsal projections and then two left laterals of the thorax. So we'll show you a couple images up top here. And we'll give you guys. In the interest of time, I will show you the cranial abdomen. Sure. Three, <laughs> to, four, three to four minutes on this. Two. Two minutes. Well, I'm going to be back. Okay. Okay, let's move on. <coughs> Does anybody have some initial thoughts on this case? Normal, abnormal, are we concerned about anything unusual? We have right lateral on the left side, left lateral projection on the other side. The spleen is big. Which projection do we see the spleen on better? This one's the right lateral. Yeah. So this. Okay. Yeah. How do we know it's the spleen? They often will, often will see the splenic tail ventrally down here. I really don't see anything on that right lateral projection. So moving up, the splenic tail could be coming down here. And we have a fat opacity separating one soft tissue organ, which we know to be the liver, and another soft tissue organ. Caudal to that makes sense that it could be the spleen. You see the spleen on the left lateral projection? So it looks a little bit smaller, but we see the tail of it kind of curling around ventrally. So you can also follow that caudal margin of the spleen up a little bit. So that's probably our spleen there. So I did check this because people have fooled me with that, and these radiographs were taken, or at least from the timestamp on them, about three or four minutes apart. So <laughs> Because sometimes people try to fool me with that. <laughs> they might took that four hours later. All right, so it looks like potentially a big spleen. Anything else? Yes? So a small liver. So on this projection here, sure, it looks like the liver is a little bit small. Measures maybe two intercostal spaces in width, kind of on the small side on the right lateral projection anyways. Left lateral view, I'd say our liver extends up to here. So a little bit more than two sides. What, o what other factor do you look at when assessing for a, mic for a small liver? So gastric axis, so where is the gastric axis? Okay, so we have some sort of gas filled structure here. And if that's the stomach, it's more cranially positioned than it should be. Anyone have any other thoughts? Are we sure that that's our stomach? It's likely part of the stomach. because There isn't much else that's gas filled that should be in that location. But do you see the rest of the stomach? Or do you see the stomach somewhere else? So the orthogonal projection may help. Yes? So a couple too many gas bubbles. So we have kind of these three segments here. What was that, sorry? Excellent, so what's caudal to this? So going back to our size, shape, margination, opacity. So what's the opacity of that structure? So we have a tubular shaped, gas filled, gas opaque structure in the location of the stomach. Probably going to be the stomach. So we have what looks like the stomach. 
And I can maybe make up that there's some rugal folds here. So these linear soft tissue opaque features separated by a gas. So potentially a gastric fundus here. And if you follow that outer margin, does that connect to the other structure here where we have these three gas filled segments? Does everybody see that? That this looks like our stomach here. And what were you concerned about? Somebody say? Torsion. So what are some characteristic signs to look for for a gastric torsion? So one is a malpositioned stomach. What other key feature tells you that it's a torsed stomach versus gastric dilation and a bloat? Excellent. So when you have a rotation of your stomach, you're going to have a soft tissue band, so a soft tissue opaque band that you see compartmentalizing the two separate components of your stomach. Now it's not very dilated, but it's in an abnormal position and it has that compartmentalization. So this is very concerning for a torsion, a gastric torsion on this projection. How does that fit with a what looks like a big spleen that's potentially malpositioned maybe? Does that fit? So potentially, so if the stomach twists, your spleen can twist as well and your spleen can become congested too. So that could fit. However, our spleen doesn't really look congested on the left lateral view. And what do you think of the stomach on the left lateral view? Or what, what should you see on a left lateral projection? So left side is down. Say there's gas and fluid in the stomach. That gas and fluid is going to shift to different compartments of the stomach depending on if he's in a left or right lateral, uh, right lateral position. So normally in a right lateral position, your gastric fundus will have gas in it and your pyloric antrum will have fluid in it. And you'll often see that as a little orange or ball shaped structure on some studies um, that looks like a foreign body, but it's really just a fluid filled pyloric antrum. So you turn that patient over, you shift the gas and the fluid. The gas now shifts up. So what's up when he's on his left side? Up is going to be the pyloric antrum. So this structure here is our pyloric antrum. It's filled with gas. Can we see our gastric fundus? Anybody see our gastric fundus? Our gastric fundus is here. What about our duodenum? Or what we're suspecting is a duodenum? So it's going to be some sort of tubular shaped structure leaving the pyloric antrum. So I'm going to suggest that this could be our duodenum. Now, is that in an abnormal position? Carbohydrates are kicking in here, and everybody's. <laughs> Any thoughts? I would argue, I would say that this looks fairly normal for a left lateral projection. So we should see gas in the pylorus, and we should see fluid, and we do have a little bit of gas in that gastric fundus as well. But that seems pretty normal in position. We were chatting over here, you know, when I asked that question, is that normal looking? And we said, well, we never do a left lateral view. And I said, well, that's a problem because we tend to do a right lateral view because we don't want to miss the GDV. So that's the, the natural instinct, but the left lateral view has huge value in that dog that doesn't have a GDV but has a gastric foreign body because instantly you have a negative contrast study of the pylorus which is where those things are stuck usually. Um, and so because we tend to not necessarily do the left laterals as often, you don't see gas going out the duodenum as often and so you don't necessarily appreciate its normal location. The one thing I love about this study as much as it was confusing um, was that it actually had all the information because it had three views which is not something you see particularly often 
particularly in an abdominal series. We, we tend to get into that in the thorax a lot, always three views for METs and all that, but we don't necessarily always take three views in the abdomen. And I think that was really critical in this, in, in at least in our interpretation, is that fair? Yep. Was having those three views because I think, anyway, something changed in this dog over the course of four minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have a plan for you, too. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So the added yeah. <laughs> history there was the dog still is having some sporadic episodes of pain. We have Dr. Singh. I'd like to refer you, refer you to him. <laughs> <laughs> so what has happened here between the right lateral and left lateral? That's what it looks like. Because this is definitely a torsion on the right lateral view. And this is a normal stomach on the left lateral view. And we said, good on you for doing the left lateral because you fixed him and you got the answer all at the same time. <laughs> and that was pretty awesome. <laughs> so dogs can have chronic intermittent gastric torsions. They just don't go all the way around. They don't get stuck for whatever reason. They're still going to be painful, but treatment would be likely to pexy him, keep that stomach in one position, don't need to. Yeah, we got this nice laparoscopic technique now if you want minimally invasive. <laughs> hey, we take whatever we can get. <laughs> Good news is the dog was fixed, you know, because honestly, and even looking at that, I think, you know, that's not, that is not the GDV that I put up for the second year students to understand, right? Because that's not the classic. But when you break it down into the components of those signs, where is the stomach? Knowing that the pyloric antrum has a smooth margin and no rugal folds, and there's a portion of the stomach there that has rugal folds, you piece that all together and you go, wow, that's not like any GDV I've ever seen, and yet it is compartmentalized, and it is in an inappropriate location, and oh my gosh, it went back to a normal location, right? So it's, it's it always, whenever you look at a radiograph and you put it up and you go, I have no idea what just happened there or what that is, always go back to those basic principles. They will bail you out every single time, I guarantee it. The second you start to take a step back and say, okay, what is it that I actually see, it starts to you know, clarify in your mind what it is that's actually going on. So whenever I look at it and go, wow, I've never seen that before in my life, you always go back to those first basic principles. And don't forget to interpret the rest of the radiograph as well. Yep. So hopefully you guys picked up that there is also some intervertebral disc space narrowing, L1, 2, T13, L1, and some ventral new bone there, so some spondylosis. So there is some chronic instability at that site, and he's forming some new bone. So he could also have some potential back pain there as well. So if you pushed on that spot, he may be reactive. However, that's just in addition to his partial chronic intermittent GDV. Yep. As a little aside, the ventral aspect of this vertebrae looks a little less well-defined. That's where the diaphragm attaches. That's actually quite normal. So again, when you're looking at these guys and you think they maybe have back pain, you start scrutinizing things that you've never looked at before. I know we probably all experienced it at some point in our residencies where we said, I've never seen that before. And my mentor would pull the radiograph off the shelf that I just finished reading and say, it's right there. Because <laughs> that dog didn't have back pain, so I didn't notice. This one right here. It's just a little fuzzier, a little less well-defined. It's L3, L4 is where the cruciate diaphragm actually attaches. It's hard to remember it actually attaches that far caudally. But again, you think about back pain, you're going to zero in on that all of a sudden because you're desperately looking for a reason why he might have some pain um, versus noting that it's there all the time. And I think we concluded on this one, the thorax was normal, is that right? Yes. Okay. Questions mm -hmm. on that? It did look enlarged, yes. I don't, I wouldn't expect congestion to go away that quickly. <laughs> um, so it could just be position and we're just getting an oblique look at that spleen. But we're um, not looking at the tail, we're kind of looking at the C shape of the curve, right? Yeah. So it's more the malposition of the spleen that's giving us that appearance than an actual congested spleen. Okay, okay moving on. Case three, 11-year-old spade female Sharpay has been coughing blood. 
weight maintained in the clotting panel is normal. So we have a few studies here. These are from two different dates. Um, we, have, we have a right lateral, a left lateral from, what are the dates? October 1st. From October 1st. And then the 17th or 18th. And then we have end of ED as well. And then we have a left lateral and a VD from how long after? Two weeks later? Yeah, about that. Two weeks later. Okay, so what do you want me to pull up? Uh, maybe the two left laterals. So we'll give you guys, again, a couple minutes to uh, look through these. <laughs> yeah, that'll be good. So up on the screen we have projected two left laterals, one from the earlier date and one from two weeks later. If you look at your pieces of paper, the ventral dorsal projections might not actually help you too much. So we'll go through those. Okay, let's go over case number three. Our Sharpe that's coughing blood. We'll go through the other uh -oh, projections. We better have the answer because we lost. <laughs> so this is predominantly a lung study. So you obviously want to evaluate the entire radiograph. <coughs> However, we're going to focus in on the lungs for this particular study. So when I look at the lungs, I ask myself, is there an increased opacity or is there a decreased opacity? 95% of the time the answer is going to be there's an increased opacity of some kind. Because a decreased opacity is going to be some sort of gas-filled structure, a bulla, a gas cap, and an abscess, something rare like that. So most of the time, you're going to have an increased pulmonary opacity. So we're either going to say, is this going to be a normal lung? Do we have an increased pulmonary opacity? Do we have a decreased pulmonary opacity? Anybody vote on a normal lung? Probably not, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> Abnormal lung, do we have an increased pulmonary opacity? Yes. Where do we have an increased pulmonary opacity? Any thoughts? Yes. In the bronchial tree, so like bronchial markings, bronchial pattern. So I'd say in some locations, yes. If you guys look carefully in the cotodorsal lung field, we have some donuts, if you will. So we have a round, soft tissue, opaque structure with a central gas lucency, which is going to be a bronchus. So we do have some bronchial markings there. What else? Are we talking about just the one study or both of them? Um, in case they're wondering. That's a good point. I don't see what I was hoping to see on this right study here. Showed up better on our computers. That one? Well, we can start with the cranial lung field. Anybody see anything unusual in the cranial lung lobes? Can you move the other uh, study back? Does anybody see any abnormalities in the cranial lung fields before we get to the caudal lung fields? So especially noticeable on this study here, we have a round, so how would we describe that? Using our Rankin signs. So circular, ovoid, opacity, what kind of opacity? That's not an opacity, remember? Soft so tissue, gas. Soft tissue. soft tissue and fluid. So you never want to forget fluid. This could be an abscess. This could be a fluid-filled pocket. We can't tell radiographically what that is. So it's a nodule. has a soft tissue fluid opacity. That's all we can say. Well, we can measure it. It's another Rankin sign. How big is it? Um, difference between pulmonary nodules, pulmonary masses, basically a size thing. Basically a human term 
or human characterization of three centimeters. Anything smaller than three centimeters is a nodule. Anything larger than three centimeters is a mass. I tend to follow that in dogs, especially bigger dogs, in cats and small dogs. If you have a three centimeter nodule for that small animal, it's probably quite a large mass. So I just call it a mass and throw that characterization out the window a little bit. This is a good sized dog, good sized lung lobe. We only have a small little nodule. So he's got one nodule. And if you compare the two studies, is there another right lateral from previous I thought we had? Oh, that was a right lateral. Okay. Well, we can still see that nodule superimposed there. I think there was a previous right lateral where it shows up as well in a slightly Sorry. different location, if I recall. I might be wrong. Maybe that was it. Okay, maybe not. I take that back. So but we had a we quick question from YouTube. Is that both at the same time? Is that your question? And so, yes, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood my text there appropriately. But no, so the images on the left are October the 1st, and the images on the right are currently October the 17th or 18th. So about just over 200 weeks later. Okay, so we have a soft tissue opaque nodule. It looks like it's getting bigger in size in two weeks. So if you were to measure that, subjectively anyways, it looks like it's getting bigger in size, Potent potentially anyways. A little strange for two weeks, but... That's okay. And we now have fancy tools, so we can measure it. Remember, so these aren't calibrated. <laughs> That's why it says pixels, not centimeters, because it doesn't have any idea what the size of the plate was. But, and there's also degrees of magnification. So there, I, would, I would characterize that as pretty similar. <laughs> okay. That's all I see in the cranial lung field. Everything else is basically gas-filled. And we can see our pulmonary artery and our pulmonary vein going to our cranial lung lobe. We can see that vessel. You can follow that vessel very well. If you can see the entire margin of that vessel, it's going to be surrounded by gas. You're going to have good contrast. You're going to have a normal remainder of that lung. Question? Um, is that cranial bronchus enlarged? So the bronchus... View? On this view, is that what you're asking? Is the cranial bronch the bronchus of the cranial lung lobe enlarged on this view? So the bronchus is going to be situated between your pulmonary artery and your pulmonary vein to that cranial lung lobe, but it's not necessarily taking up that entire space. So if you have mineralization of the wall, which we may have in this case here, and okay, well in this case it might take up that whole width. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to give the exact Not same explanation example. that Dr. Zulinda just said, which is, you know, the space between those vessels is where the bronchus lives, but it's not necessarily the whole thing. And then I zoomed and went, wow, look at that mall's it mineralized. Is. So yeah, it's probably pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes, I, oops, geez, I'm, I'm having driving difficulties all of a sudden. Um, so yes, I, I mean, for me, that's fairly large. Right. It does look a little large there. It doesn't, it's a little bit difficult to see. It does a taper towards the periphery. Um, I'd expect it to taper a little bit, but yes, since we do have a mineralized wall, it does look like it could be a little bit enlarged. You can even see it branch here. So it is tapering because you can follow its branch. It's quite prominent, but. I'd probably call this a normal variant. Um, I wouldn't think that this would be bronchiectasis in this case. I'd expect it to be a larger, I'd expect it to be this diameter, but closer towards the periphery and not so central and still be this width for bronchiectasis. And you can sometimes also get a thickened wall as well, but. Does everybody understand the term bronchiectasis? No, okay. So bronchiectasis is an abnormal dilation of the bronchus. It's, it's if I, I will probably massacre the pathogenesis, but I think of it similar to tracheal collapse where there's really damage to the cartilage and weakening of the cartilage and so now the airway will dilate and it can take on several different forms in terms of how it dilates. So they describe sort of this great blight or saccular dilation or just very large bronchi. And that's an irreversible change. So if you see signs that the airways are dilated, and particularly the secondary and tertiary airways, so more again towards the periphery, that's irreversible and generally carries a fairly poor prognosis. So I think what you're looking for here is, is a very important finding. 
because if he had dilation all the way out to those peripheral airways, that would mean this dog is not likely going to respond all that well to treatment. So that's what bronchiectasis is. And we debate over that quite a bit. CT is by far and away a better tool to pick that up because you are looking at those airways in the periphery for that change. And I think Dr. Zerlinden wants to talk about the right lateral, so here it is. Ah, there Sorry, it is. Sorry, that's the same day. Okay. That's what I was looking for. So this was the initial radiograph study again. So does anybody see a change, an altered pulmonary opacity, in more of the caudal lung fields at all? Yes? So yes, we do have an increased pulmonary opacity. Next obvious question is where? Don't tell him I did that. <laughs> or another question is, what structure are we not seeing very well on this lateral projection that we should see outlined by air in the lungs? So what structure do we see on this left lateral projection that we don't see on the right lateral projection? So the aorta is going to be up here. I'd say we see it on both. Here's our caudal vena cava going through the diaphragm. Where's the caudal vena cava on the right lateral projection? That might be the dorsal border of it there. But where is our ventral border? So we can't really see it. So we have an increased pulmonary opacity surrounding or silhouetting, summating with our border of the caudal vena cava. Now, can we further characterize this, what I'm calling an increased pulmonary opacity? Can we give it any radiographic signs? I'm looking now in this region here. Are there any characteristic radiographic signs that we can help clarify? Excellent. So if you look carefully, we have these branching gas-filled structures throughout this increased pulmonary opacity. So that's the definition of um, air bronchograms. And air bronchograms are seen with white type of pulmonary pattern. Yes? Yes, so there is a slight change in the diaphragm between inspiratory and expiratory. Yes. So the space can change, but you should still have a gas, opa gas opaque lungs between. So this little triangle here should be completely um, gas opaque. And you shouldn't, even if even on uh, an expiratory study, you still shouldn't see air bronchograms. So it's this increased pulmonary opacity with air bronchograms on this study, uh, silhouetting at the ventral border of our caudal vena cava. You guys know which lung lobe lives immediately adjacent to the caudal vena cava and is likely affected in this case? Thought I heard something. I heard accessory. So the accessory lung lobe is going to say right on midline. And if your accessory lung lobe is affected by a mass, by pneumonia, by hemorrhage, by, <coughs> by whatever, you won't be able to see your caudal vena cava really well. So, so sorry. Be before you go on, I have one, yes. one question from the online audience for yes. you which is uh, that this nodule seems triangular on the initial view and round on the subsequent view two weeks later. And do you have an explanation for that? This is, that is a very good question. Um, I thought about that myself, and I just figured I'd skip over that <laughs> and move on to the nice round nodule on our left <laughs> lateral projection. Um, so off the top of my head, I do not. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, we are possibly making up some of the borders of this nodule. So we have a few ribs overlying that pulmonary nodule and giving a nice straight edge to it. Um, so if you, look, if you look past the ribs, if you will, and you can see a nice, okay. Did you change your studies or is that the same one? The same one. Okay. 
So I'm liking where I'm going because this actually makes sense now. So look past that rib and you can actually, if you get rid of that rib, you'll actually see a nice rounded nodule there. There is a line that kind of deviates dorsally here that I'm going to say is a branching blood vessel here. So that border is made up artificially by a blood vessel. Cranial border is made up artificially by a rib. So it's still a nice round soft tissue opaque nodule on the previous study. Yeah, I don't, it's harder to get the displaying, but I, that's the nodule there. That's the cranial border. So I think you see the rib really obviously. I like that explanation. It was, it was better than one I was going to come up with, which is just <laughs> I don't know either and I'm moving on. <laughs> so. Okay. So where was I? Oh, can you just flip to the ventral dorsal projection yes. of that first study? Yep. So we saw air bronchograms on the lateral projection, so we should still see air bronchograms on the ventral dorsal projection. And I think it shows up a little bit better on this ventral dorsal projection, but we see gas-filled, branching, tubular-shaped structures. And it's a little bit more difficult to appreciate the increased pulmonary opacity because the lung is actually superimposed with the diaphragm and the liver. So it can be a little bit tricky to pick that up, and that's where you often need that orthogonal projection to help assess that lung. So remember, um, think about it. Whenever I'm stuck on, like, why doesn't it look as black as it should, or why doesn't it look as white as it should, I look at the uh, orthogonal view and say, okay, well, there's gas in the lung, and then there's abnormal lung, and then there's heart. So I'm going through all of that, which means I am going to see gas superimposed on this lesion. It's not just going to be pure white versus shooting through it in a different direction, you may see no gas superimposed on it, and therefore it makes sense that it, the opacity may change slightly from one view to the other. Okay, so on our initial study, we have a pulmonary nodule and a cranial lung lobe. Not sure which side. And we have an alveolar pattern in the accessory lung lobe. Any I'm other gonna, findings? I'm going to argue that we see it on the right. This is in the right. Because we see it very well on our left lateral view. True, correct. I was just going back to the initial. Is that the initial left lateral? No. They're both, they were both on the left okay. side. So. so our left side is down. Our right side is up. Our right side is more aerated. It's going to be surrounded. If we have a soft tissue opaque nodule, it's going to be surrounded by more <laughs> gas. It's going to be in the right side of the lung. If you take a right lateral projection and you have a nodule in your right lung lobe, that nodule is going to be surrounded by compressed lung. It's not going to have as much air in it your contrast is going to be reduced and you won't, it may completely hide that nodule or it may just not be as well defined. Does that make sense? That's why we often take right laterals and left laterals of the thorax. Our online audience got the alveolar pattern too. I'm just a little slow, sorry. All right. So going back to our initial study, we have a pulmonary nodule likely in the right side and an alveolar pattern, sorry, alveolar pattern in the accessory lung lobe. Dog is coughing blood. What are some thoughts so far before we move on to the second study? Or what are, what are some, what are our basic differentials for an alveolar pattern? I have three very basic differentials. Tumor, potentially. That's kind of my fourth, fourth extra one. Since it's fairly diffuse, so it's something is filling um, filling the alveoli, there's still air in the lungs, air in the airways. Hemorrhage, so blood, pus, and what's the third one? What else can you fill up your alveoli with? Fluid. Keep it simple. Blood, pus, edema. Three basic differentials for any alveolar pulmonary pattern. So then you rank them. So we'll, pulmonary edema. Uh, it's the accessory lung lobe, one lung lobe. Doesn't seem to have a heart issue. It's probably not going to be pulmonary edema. It's a very atypical distribution. That's going to be more uh, caudal dorsal or perihilar distribution. So that leaves us with hemorrhage and pus or pneumonia. What do you guys think? Could it still be both, one higher than the other? This is a good time to reflect back on the history. So he's coughing up blood. Either way, even if there was pneumonia or hemorrhage in that lung, he would probably still be coughing up blood, so that may not help you too much. Yes, question in the back. Yes. Yes. 
Which was pretty funny because when we looked at this, we said, yeah, yeah, that needle's probably been there forever. Because it's not uncommon to find a needle. You think it's in the stomach, it might actually have gone lateral through the stomach wall and it's probably sitting in the liver and you'll probably never find it and it'll probably never cause a problem. So we just ignored it. <laughs> Where was I going with that? You're going pneumonia versus pattern. blood. Pneumonia versus blood. <laughs> Can we tell the difference? Probably not. Kind of an atypical location for pneumonia. If it's aspiration pneumonia, it's probably going to be a craniovental distribution. He's coughing blood. He's got a pulmonary nodule. Maybe rank hemorrhage highest on your differential list. Keep pneumonia lower down if your hemorrhage doesn't pan out. That is our theory for the first study, yes. One thing though that's really important to remember when you have something that's a little bit mixed like this, so there's an alveolar component to this and then there's a nodule, is that in the face of an alveolar lung pattern, which means the lung is so white that you can't see any normal air, there it can hide nodules. So what I don't know is, is there a mass in that lung lobe and the mass bled and now it's full of blood and I don't see the mass anymore. I don't know the answer to that question. And so one of the, it's one of the reasons why we don't do thoracic radiographs under anesthesia, particularly if we're doing MET checks, because when the lung is collapsed and has no air in it, I can't see nodules in it because it's surrounded by soft tissue. So I need the lung to be full of air to answer a question of is there a discrete mass in there? And this lung is not full of air. So one of the things, again, if I think about things that are underutilized, this dog has a nodule, so that already alerts me to the whole cancer thing because that scares me a lot to have nodules. Sure, it could be an abscess, it could be a granuloma, you know, but I have an alveolar pattern, I go, what's, what's underlying this? Really, repeating the radiographs, which is what you did, is a great next step, right? So sometimes they're not sick enough, it's not definitive enough, but in a couple of weeks, there's enough of a change that makes you very comfortable that you have the right answer, and so I think... Depends on the antibiotics that you use continually. Right. And I probably, even though I would put pneumonia lower on the list because the distribution is quite atypical, so I, into accessory lung lobe would be odd unless they were anesthetized or, you know, standing upright or whatever when they aspirated, which doesn't usually happen. Um, I would have that lower, but yet I know that a lung full of blood might also be prone to infection. So I don't know that I would not put them on antibiotics knowing that as the one thing that I can do, right? Again, I always think about treat the treatable. In my own animals, you know, I... I they, they, they want me to CT my cat that we think has a nasopharyngeal polyp, but, you know, treat the treatable. I, I, there's nothing I'm going to do for it right now because he's nasty as I'll get out. <laughs> so <laughs> so we're, we're just going to deal with it at home, right? And I think that's very logical in this kind of situation as well. Treat what you know you can do something about. All right, so moving on to two weeks later. So we compared our previous study to this. So our caudal vena cava we can see really well. So we've... We seem to have lost our, or at least a portion of our alveolar pulmonary pattern in our accessory lung lobe, but do we have something else abnormal in that location or near to that change in the accessory lung lobe? Anybody see anything that looks abnormal on this study? My laser pointer broke. Break my laser pointer? No, no, no. It doesn't work. That's for new battery. Light still works. Can I steal that? Yeah, go ahead. What if I highlighted a structure? It's okay, we'll switch. <laughs> so where's what should you see in the perihyla region? in this region here. What should you be able to see? So tracheal bifurcation, so we can follow our trachea here. You gotta stop leaning up against that. So we can follow our trachea here to our carina. It's gonna bifurcate, we don't really see that. What else should we see? Right here. So, what, well, let me go back to what else 
do we expect to see in the location of the perihyla region? So lymph nodes. What else comes branching off here? Sorry? So we're going to have a pulmonary blood vessels, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins. That's, that's going to make up most of the structures coming off of here. What was that? Thoracic duct. Thoracic duct. That's going to be a little bit more dorsal. Hopefully it'll be running right a little here. closer to the aorta, but yeah. So, plus don't forget the caudal, caudal dorsal border of your cardiac silhouette you should be able to see. That's where you look for an enlarged left atrium. Once you see all those structures, they should all be surrounded by gas. So it should all be gas in your lungs, nicely highlighting all of those structures. I don't see that here. What I see is an increased or a soft tissue fluid opaque structure in the perihyla region. Or this is just a lateral projection, so you're not quite entirely sure where in the patient it is, if it's lateral, midline or whatnot. There is an ovoid structure right here. Anybody have any thoughts on what that could be? Ovoid structures in the lungs. If you have an ovoid structure in the periphery and you can attach it to a linear branching structure, it's going to be an end on blood vessel. So it's a blood vessel coming out of the screen at you. The same works for the perihyla region where you have a large pulmonary artery or a large pulmonary vein and it actually starts coming out at you and then takes a, a bend and branches. That's why we never look for pulmonary nodules in the perihyla region because you see that pulmonary artery, right? It wraps around and it branches to feed the right and left lung lobe. On a lateral view, those are end on all the time. So a big nodule right in the perihyla region is almost always going to be one of those vessels. Don't ever call that a mat. Yeah. So you'll see the appearance of this. Looks very much like the appearance of that on a radiograph. However, that we're calling a nodule, and that we're calling a normal blood vessel, normal end on blood vessel. So any vessel you look at, or any nodule, round soft tissue structure you're looking at, make sure you know how big it is relative to the vessels that you expect to see in that location. That's that. Okay. So we should have gas-filled lung in this location and we don't have that. So the question is, what is that? Well, we may need another view, which we have here. What are you guys' thoughts on this ventral dorsal projection on this side? Could we do something to this projection to possibly be able to better differentiate what's going on on this side. Any thoughts? Is this radiograph straight? <laughs> I know. Okay, that happens. I understand that. <laughs> so you can see the spinous processes here. They're going off to the side. And I don't I think I see the sternobrae, but they're probably on just off to the midline. So the patient's a little bit rotated. Not a big deal. We can't get them straight all the time. But if we can't get them straight, what can we possibly do to get a better look at this lung like we have a good look at that lung field? So we can't get them straight, but we can do a paired oblique. So if you can't get one nice straight VD, well, getting two paired slightly oblique views can give you um, a lot more information um, than just this. I still think this is okay, but it may have helped um, pick up this lesion a little bit better on the ventral dorsal projection. So if you look carefully, so if you really can't see an abnormality that you're looking at, outline and trace a normal structure. So start with anything normal you can pick up. So I'd start with a cardiac silhouette. So you can outline that cardiac silhouette on the ventral dorsal projection quite nicely. And we're looking for some sort of ovoid soft tissue opaque structure. And I can see that superimposed over the, cardi over the apex of the cardiac silhouette right here. Everybody see that? So a nice, 
fairly well-defined caudal border here. So we have mass and lung superimposed over this region, and then we have air-filled lung just caudal through that. In this case, it's a little bit tricky to pick up on the ventral dorsal projection, but this looks like it's in the left caudal lung lobe. Now, why do we see it on our left lateral projection, so left side down? You may assume you would think that you should see it really well on a right lateral projection, and we probably would. We'd probably see it a lot better on a right lateral projection since it's in the left caudal lung lobe. So we see it on the left lateral projection, but we don't see it as well as we would on a right lateral projection. We'd see a nice, you know, our lung, fill, our lung would be nice and air-filled and would surround that mass nicely and provide adequate contrast so we could pick up those margins really well. So now we have one large pulmonary mass that we didn't really pick up before on the previous study. And we still have a pulmonary nodule in the cranial lung field. So now we move on to what are our differentials for this? Any thoughts? One mass, one nodule in, in the lung fields? Yes, question. I just have a question regarding that cranial pulmonary mass. Yes. Good question. So regarding the cranial pulmonary nodule, how do we know that it's in the lungs versus somewhere else? Um, this is why we take orthogonal projections. So you, ideally, you would see your pulmonary nodule on both views. If it's superimposed with the lung on both views, it's going to be in the lung. Now, am I making that up? Is that it? I don't know, because I was asking myself the same question. Why don't I see it on this Could view? And I think a part of it might be if it's close to midline and they're oblique, it's now going to be superimposed on the, on the left thorax, so perhaps hidden under the vertebrae and sternobrae because of that obliquity. Um, so that's one thing, again, thinking about how do you piece all that information together, because ideally, in the perfect world, all the views match, and they all give you the exact same information, but that my perfect world doesn't happen very often, so that's something to consider. I think the other is, and, and you, you may be absolutely right, Alex, it, it might be right in here and we're just not seeing it as clearly. Again, maybe that's partly positioning. I always think about, though, I see it. It's soft tissue and I see it. So what does that mean? It is surrounded by something that is not soft tissue. So it has two choices. It's in the lung or it's in the subcutaneous fat. Those are its only two choices. If it's in the esophagus, it's surrounded by soft tissue. Or it's in the esophagus, it's surrounded by air. And I should see more air in the esophagus, right? If it's in the trachea, then I should not see it, you know, superimposed half on the trachea and half not on the trachea, right? So to see it, it has to be contrasted by something that is not soft tissue, and that would be not in the esophagus. So that's, so again, that's that why it's very important to say, not just there's an opacity, but there is a soft tissue opacity, because then that leads you to, well, if I see it and distinct margins, it's surrounded by something that is not soft tissue or fluid. And the good example for the subcutaneous mass, if you notice the teats on this patient, so you'll notice there's at least two here. You know those are on the outside of the patient, but you can see them really well because they're external, they're surrounded by external gas, and so they show up really well. Oh, I lost it. Oh, sorry. So that's the same type of thing. If you have a subcutaneous mass bulging on the outside, it's surrounded by gas, it's gonna show up really well on the lateral projection. But you should be able to pick that up on a ventral dorsal projection as some sort of body wall mass, which we don't see in this case. So that lends more evidence to the fact that it should be in the lung lobes. So one comment that we've had as well is, um, is the mass in the caudal and accessory lung lobe, is it actually moving the cardiac axis laterally? Because that's what it looks like. If you look at this, the, the heart is shifted to the left on both those studies. So what is that a result of? Is that a result of the mass or is that a result of the lung itself being small and the heart shifting to fill the space? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? before I take a stab at that. So what would we expect? So say this was a straight ventral dorsal projection. We have a mass in one lung lobe. That's pretty big. Where would we expect that cardiac silhouette or that heart to, to be positioned? Should it be in its normal position? Would it shift? Which way? Right, would it would expect it to shift away from the mass. Um, now, when does your heart shift towards a lesion or 
See, we have an increased pulmonary opacity and our heart shifts towards that increased pulmonary opacity. What kind of process is going on with that? Excellent. So our lung lobe is small. We're compressing it. Um, if they're sedated, anesthetized, and you place them on right lateral recumbency, that right middle lung lobe will get small, compressed. It won't have any gas in it. Um, it's going to be atelectatic, and that heart is going to shift towards that lesion. So we call it a mediastinal shift, either towards or away from our lesion. And that so may also partly explain why we didn't, this is, sorry, I've now flopped the one on the right. Is that light? It's getting light. Uh, is the original study, this is the later study. It, it might partially explain why we don't see the mass originally, because again, in that face of that atelectasis, the mass has to get that much bigger for us to see the change in shape of the lung lobe when the lung is fully white. So it may have been obscured initially, not large enough, but also obscured by that atelectasis, which was there sort of on both studies, making it harder to see. And a positioning effect as well. Mm -hmm. So if the patient's rotated, that cardiac silhouette is going to appear to be more displaced over to the left side. So it could be a component of atelectasis, could be a component of positioning. Um, and also, um, if you're going to shift the cardiac silhouette, you have to be right next to the cardiac silhouette to shift it. So one reason why we probably don't have a shift in that, in that cardiac silhouette is because that mass is dorsal. So it's not going to influence that position of the, the heart as well. Okay. Oh, it's 9.05. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Okay. So, so what do we think of this one? Sum did we get up? any differentials to sum it up? So large pulmonary mass, left caudal lung lobe, small nodule in the right, right cranial lung lobe. What are some differentials? Or what are our basic differentials for any pulmonary mass? Abscess, granuloma, neoplasia. Can we rank those? Basically, if we go back to our history at all, does that help? Coughing blood, normal clotting panel, 11-year-old Sharpe. Anybody rank any of those higher than the other? Yeah, no good things come from coughing blood. Sure. Apparently could it no be? good things come from your clinic this week either. <laughs> So it's possible it could be some sort of fungal granuloma. That large mass is pretty large. I really wouldn't expect that to be the case. An abscess in an older dog, not very common. Neoplasia, a lot more common, 11-year-old dog. One large mass, one smaller mass. Likely the larger mass is going to be your primary neoplasm, and he's got a secondary metastasis. Most common neoplasm in dog lungs would be a carcinoma, carcinoma of some kind. Questions? So how do you get your final diagnosis? So we have a mass on a nodule on radiographs. That might be enough for the owners if you talk to them. 11-year-old dog, probably neoplasia, probably carcinoma. They might be okay with that. They're not going to treat it. It's in two lung lobes. They're not going to give chemo, may give steroids. He's still doing okay, potentially. His weight is maintained. You can just go on status quo. This one might scare me a little bit to aspirate without some sort of guidance. Um, but, and, and the only reason being that it's very perihilar on that lateral view, which means I do have a chance of hitting a major blood vessel as I do that. But, you know, keep that in mind. If it's touching a body wall and you can localize to the 12th rib, halfway up or at the cost of conjunction on the radiographs, there isn't a lot of risk of, of trying, right? If you've got no other option, they want a little bit of extra information. The worst case is they're going to develop a pneumothorax with a fine needle aspirate that's going to be relatively small. It's not an enormous risk if that helps you, or it's non-diagnostic because you missed the math. So what? You know, as long as you don't take a six-inch needle and aspirate the heart, it's probably not a big deal to give it a shot if that, again, you know, we talk about here we may have the luxury of CT and now CT guided aspirates or thoracoscopy and all that, but really you don't have that in every instance. You have a client who just wants to be as confident as possible that there's nothing that they can do, that they're not going to treat this and need that answer. So use those radiographs to guide you to stick a needle in that and don't be too scared of that. Other questions? 
So if the patient came in here, would probably, or we could offer like a CT guided aspirate potentially, a little bit more confidence in guiding a needle into that mass. Um, depending on how close it was to the body wall, um, which we can't really assess too much, potentially ultrasound guidance as long as you don't have gas in the lungs between the body wall and the mass. Ultrasound may be helpful. It's surprising how on many radiographs it looks like there won't be a window, that there's too much gas, and you'll find it on ultrasound still. So it's a, it's a good thing to always just check. If you have ultrasound, it's not really hard to identify a mass on ultrasound. There's either air or there's solid soft tissue um, to help guide that. So. Any questions? We don't want to take this too long. There were a few clinics just before we totally wrap up that sent me some other radiographs that we didn't get to, and I apologize we didn't get to them. But if you want answers on them, we're all here. We've got two computers. We're happy to go through them and just make sure that we answer whatever your specific questions were. We're more than happy to do that and entertain any questions you have. I'm not sure if we successfully assisted you in interpreting radiographs better or not, because as you can see, there's a lot of, ironically, shades of gray in interpreting radiographs. Um, but hopefully you can understand that thought process. And the goal was really to go through that thought process and the discussions that we have and the way we work through things to come to that answer when we don't really know. And, um, and that's really what it is every day, is going back to those basic principles and being systematic and being thorough. If you want to stay, sure. if you guys we want can to stay, that. whoever wants to leave, that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Does anybody know for this case? Is there a signal mint? I don't have a signal mint on my piece of paper. Yeah, that was a OBC referral case. Do we have? Oh, yeah, I had that. Uh, three-year-old male castrated shih tzu. Okay, three-year-old male castrated shih tzu. Excellent, thank you. Persistent productive cough with eosinophilia. So patient presented to OVC. So this is the radiographs that were performed here on December 3rd. So we're gonna go through a few different series here. Do I have this right? Yeah. Okay, and I was pretty sure these were the first and then the two sets you sent me were later, is that right? Right, yeah. they, it was referred here for a yeah. and they declined it <laughs> until later. Right, so I, I noticed that. <laughs> but I'm glad you did it. Okay, so again, another <coughs> lung radiograph. So you'll notice our cardiac silhouette right in the middle here, outlined by gas-filled lung all the way around, with the exception of the right lateral aspect of that cardiac silhouette. So we have an increased pulmonary opacity in the right middle lung lobe. So you can see that on both projections. So left lateral projection, left side down, right side up. What we're seeing really well is the right lung lobes. Now, all we see on this lateral projection is this nice low bar sign. So nice curvilinear line. We have a soft tissue fluid opacity cranial to that line. And we have normal air filled right caudal lung lobe caudal to that line. And we can correlate that with this triangular shaped soft tissue fluid opacity on the ventral dorsal projection. It's basically all we see on this initial study. Um, one thing I'd say, if you look carefully at this spine, you'll notice the spinous processes are nearly perpendicular or nearly in line, a little bit obliqued, but it's a fairly straight radiograph. So the cardiac silhouette should fit slightly in the left hemithorax. And I'd say it's a little bit more on midline, a little bit shifted into that right side. It's a little bit closer to the thoracic body wall than the left side, all right? So increased pulmonary opacity, right middle lung lobe. What are differentials? Blood pus edema. Is it pulmonary edema? Probably not more of a perihilar, symmetrical distribution. Hemorrhage, sure, could be hemorrhage. Pneumonia, pus, three. So one thing that we don't see in this case is air bronchograms, but you don't always see air bronchograms in cases of pneumonia. 
If you don't see air bronchograms, you could still have exudate filling up your airways, and that's why you don't see the air bronchograms. So you only see air bronchograms when the alveoli are affected and the airways still have gas in them. So some sort of alveolar pattern could be pneumonia, could be atelectasis. So is this lung lobe actually smaller? And that's why we're getting this right-sided mediastinal shift. Could it be hemorrhage? Sure. Now we also have this random, this history of an eosinophilia. Does anybody know of any conditions that can cause an eosinophilia with a lung pattern? So parasites can cause an eosinophilia. There's a bunch of them. Could be heartworm. I don't see any changes in his heart, so it's probably not heartworm. Parasites, what else can cause an eosinophilia? So allergic airway disease, kind of the two main things that I think of. Tumor. We're a cancer clinic here, so we think about tumor all the time. But there are some neoplasms that will increase mast cells and eosinophils, so less likely, but something to think about. And there's one specific condition that can be seen. First thing I think of when I see either an alveolar pattern, and I think, sorry, I didn't really mention this dog, also has um, noticeable bronchi, so he does have a bit of a bronchial pattern. So bronchial pattern, alveolar pulmonary opacity, yes? Excellent. That is the correct term that we were looking for. So an eosinophilic bronchopneumopathy won't really go into the pathophysiology, but associated with allergic airway disease. Um, so for those who are older like me, that used to be pulmonary infiltrates with eosinophils. Yeah. It PIE, changed names. PIE. Again. <laughs> so the new term is an eosinophilic bronchopneumopathy. Yes. Same thing. That's the same thing. That's the older yeah. term for it. Yeah, eosinophilic. Yeah, pulmonary infiltrates with eosinophils was the original. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like bacteria. They got to change names every once in a while to make you learn something new. So that's kind of one, you know, that's one thing on my differential list. Radiographically, we still can't differentiate those three. Could be any or all. But hopefully that would lead you to some other diagnostic or some alternative treatment. I think what we thought when we first looked at this, I've seen lots of eosinophilic pneumonopathies, and they tend to be a very pronounced bronchial pattern. And this really didn't strike me as that. When I pulled the original radiographs, these radiographs didn't strike me as being most pronounced as a bronchial pattern. And so I certainly took a step back and said, wow, that, the eosinophilia, the age of the patient, that makes me want to think about eosinophilic pneumonopathy. These radiographs don't really support that in the way that I thought they would. Um, and so it was great, because you took additional radiographs where the bronchial pattern became much more pronounced. So you'll notice on this study, compared to the previous study, we no longer have our nice, well-defined low bar border sign. We don't. So this is our left lateral projection. So this would be our right middle lung lobe. And I don't see an increased pulmonary opacity here, at least not a well-defined one. And I can see that cardiac silhouette really nicely. It seems that our increased pulmonary opacity in that lung lobe has resolved. However, was there a less blurry one? I thought there was. Potentially. That one? Maybe. Still looks blurry, but a little bit better. Find the projector. Looks okay here. So you'll notice you'll still see so those bronchial pattern that we saw before. So a little donut, tram lines. So little ovoid soft tissue opaque structures with radiolucent centers. All those are bronchi much more noticeable on this study compared to the previous study. So resolving alveolar pattern and a worsening bronchial pattern. Or resolved alveolar pattern. So again, we don't have that triangular shaped feature on the VD. It's gone away. However, a lot more thickened bronchial walls, if you will, are present in the caudal dorsal lung fields. It's an interesting. As I said, the original radiographs not as classic as some. The second radiographs you did, these ones are, are much more common as this more pronounced bronchial pattern is what we see. Um, and I, I think it just progressed. And we caught a phase that had some 
bronchitis and, and bronchial inflammation, and then it got worse. Um, and, and again, So I'm ecstatic, because I think he's improved a ton. And then, then we face this question that we face all the time on cases that we're following. So we'll take these radic acids and we'll go, they look so much better and the dog's feeling well and you're weaning him off the drugs and everything. We do this with the fungal pneumonias all the time as well. And we'll take radic acids, you know, six weeks later and they'll look the same and they'll go, well, do I take him off the drugs or do I not take him off the drugs? They're not normal. I don't expect them to necessarily ever go back to normal. I may never achieve that. I have to at some point say I'm going to cut this off, I'm going to stop this treatment. I like, I don't know what you like, I like two consecutive radic acids that haven't changed. That's kind of my rule of thumb over some clinically relevant interval, and that's to be determined. There's some, always some play in that. But if I have two sets of radic acids that haven't changed and they're clinically doing well, then I think you need to stop whatever you're doing and take a shot and see what happens, because you're not going to leave them on the drugs forever. Uh, do you have a, no, a guideline you use? And if you have some injury to the lung, you're going to have some residual fibrosis, and that's going to give you a false increase, or not false, but it will give you an increased pulmonary opacity, so they're never going to go back to being completely normal. You'll, you'll see them in better health. Okay. <laughs> I'd say these look, these look pretty darn good, though. Yep. I'd give them a mild bronchial pattern. Okay, questions on that case before we move on? Case number five. I'll just cut to the chase on this one. Can you do that? Sounds good. 12 year old Westy, gagging, coughing when excited overnight since the fall, improved on antibiotics, gagging, coughing more frequently now, seems to be wheezing, having trouble breathing. Started treatment with theophylline, recheck x rays done, antibiotics started again, collapsed trachea elixir was ordered. Dog came in this morning with the owner, he barely slept was up breathing hard all night, wheezing over the trachea, moderately increased respiratory noise, gave some decks. Another one that's keeping the owner up all night. <laughs> that's my guess. Were you going to do this one, did you say? No, I said I was just going to come oh, to the chase. Gonna I was going to give you the radiograph. Oh, I see. Okay. Because <laughs> they're dropping like flies. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Okay. So... He's on a tracheal elixir. Let's start with the trachea. It, oh, not yet. Okay. Well, he's ordered. It's ordered. ordered the elixir. We're suspecting <laughs> tracheal collapse. So does this dog have tracheal collapse? So here's our trachea. This is our air column in the trachea, filled with gas, obviously. Follow cranially to our thoracic inlet. And we have this soft tissue opaque structure. Extends dorsally from the tracheal wall. And what's left of our lumen, well, it's not just this, um, but the lumen of that trachea is definitely narrowed. So I would call this a redundant tracheal membrane. So that dorsal wall weakens. And actually, so if you imagine your trachea is going to be C-shaped, should be ovoid, it's going to be C-shaped. If you have a redundant tracheal membrane that extends into your lumen of your trachea, what you're left with is a crescent-shaped gas opacity, okay? So the top of that crescent is going to be this. So we can see a nice well-defined line there. That's actually the dorsal border of the trachea. Ventral border is here, and this structure is extending just into the middle of that tracheal lumen. We still have a little bit of gas on either side, that's why this region here is a little bit more radiolucent than the soft tissues dorsal to that. Does that make sense? But the, the lumen of the trachea is still narrowed and there's still a reduced airflow going through there. Now we see this a lot of times in completely normal dogs that aren't coughing, Labrador retrievers. So the clinical relevance of it is up to, well, what you see and can you palpate a nice cough on tracheal palpation? which I assume in this case would be clinically relevant in his case. However, it's not the entire story. Um, if you look at his lungs, so let's leave the trachea for now. Go to his lungs. Here's our cardiac silhouette somewhere, somewhere in there. 
We can see the ventral border down here. We can see the caudal border here. We don't really see the cranial border too well. But we do have an increased pulmonary opacity, basically diffuse throughout all the lung lobes. It's a hazy increased pulmonary opacity. We can still see some of the blood vessels. So a hazy increased pulmonary opacity I would call an interstitial pattern. Now if you notice all these donuts throughout the caudodorsal lung fields with a fairly thickened wall, that's a pretty good bronchial pattern as well. Probably a moderate to marked bronchial pattern. And you'll notice a little linear um, pleural fissure line. It doesn't widen, so pleural fissure lines, if they widen towards the periphery, it's often, or it indicates that there's pleural fluid. But if they're straight and they don't widen, it can mean one of two things. It could be a normal pleural surface, and we're just catching that tangent of that pleural surface with the x-ray beam. Or more likely in this case, we have some thickening of that pleura, so we have pleural fibrosis. So pleural fibrosis, and there may be Maybe some more. I don't see them on this view. Moderate bronchial pattern and a diffuse, mild to moderate interstitial pattern. Mm -hmm. Yes, question. Yes. That one? Um, can you scroll down or move the whole thing down a little bit? A little bit more? <coughs> okay. <laughs> I was just looking at how I was looking at how much tissue he has <laughs> up dorsally on his spine. So a skinny dog really shouldn't have too much mediastinal fat. But in a lot of dogs that have a little bit more tissue than they should, you may not be able to palpate these dorsal spinous or these spinous processes. Um, they will often get fat either pericardial fat or mediastinal fat, and that can give that kind of wavy appearance. Now, pleural fluid can look similar, but that's why you'd want to take your dorsal ventral, ventral dorsal projections, look really closely for pleural fissure lines to see if there is pleural effusion. But in this case, this is just going to be fat. And another way we can tell, sorry, if you go back to that lateral projection. I was just proving there's no fissure lines okay, in DD. Thank you. Just because <laughs> That's, that's exactly what I did. He missed when I, I actually moved it down before to see how much fat there was to go, is that fluid or fat? And I might go, because when that question comes up, how am I going to answer that? Um, but I look for fissure lines on the other view as well. And, and again, how much fat there is elsewhere on the dog. Now, you shouldn't, if you have pleural fluid, you're not going to be able to see your cardiac silhouette. So if you have pleural effusion, it's going to surround your cardiac silhouette. That fluid opacity is going to silhouette with your soft tissue opacity of your cardiac silhouette. Whereas I will argue and say that I can actually see, be it not that well, but I can see that ventral margin of the cardiac silhouette. So that tells me that I have to have something other than soft tissue fluid. The only other thing is going to be fat. So it has to be fat. It's, it's tricky to see here, but I, for sure you can see the apex of the heart right there, which says it's not fluid. OK, so where were we? Bronchial pattern. Interstitial pattern, looks like a collapsing trachea, redundant tracheal membrane. And a coughing dog. And a coughing dog. Any thoughts? Does that not actually cause the dead in the That's not good. Any thoughts in a Westie? What was that? Yep. yep, idiopathic pulmonary Excellent. fibrosis. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is common, not commonly, it's rarely seen, but if you see it in any dog, it's going to be a Westie, um, in my experience anyways. Mm -hmm. That can explain the pleural fissure or some pleural fibrosis. It explains the interstitial pattern um, and the bronchial pattern. Could be fibrosis, could be... Uh, chronic airway disease, allergic airway disease, potentially on top of that as well, or just associated with that fibrosis. There was one other finding in this case, 
Um, if you go to the VD view, please. So we assess the lungs, we assess the cardiac silhouette. We also want to assess the pulmonary vasculature. So on the dorsal ventral projection, we can't really assess the cranial lung, cranial pulmonary vasculature, vasculature too well, but we can assess the caudal pulmonary vasculature. So the most lateral structures where my red pointer is and over on this side, it's going to be your pulmonary artery. So your arteries are on the outside, pulmonary veins are going to be on the inside, assessing the size between the two. One is actually bigger than the other. So we have a fairly or moderately enlarged pulmonary artery compared to a really thin pulmonary vein. So we have an asymmetry there. Anybody have any thoughts what can cause pulmonary artery dilation? A normal or small pulmonary vein. And it's not heartworm. <laughs> okay, your little red marker. I know, it's not, it's not showing up anymore. I apologize. I thought I needed my eyes checked. No, I think it's fading. I think, it's, I think you have pointer. The green one was better before. I think you have pointer problems. I think so. That's possible. That's the artery. And this is the vein. That little guy there. Excellent. So pulmonary hypertension. So we have some sort of resistance in the lungs, get a backup of blood flow, dilated pulmonary arteries. So why is what's causing an increased resistance in the lungs? Pulmonary fibrosis. So, so one of the most common causes of pulmonary arterial hypertension is heartworm, but this is not that. So in this one, I think what we discussed uh, when we were looking at this case was tracheal collapse could cause some of the signs, right? Because the signs, there was quite a lot of signs that were provided and bronchitis or pulmonary fibrosis could, could contribute. And so both of them could be contributing factors. So again, from an imaging perspective, I think you have to consider both of those problems. And then it sometimes does mean going back to the owners and, and inquiring more deeply is it really coughing? What is really happening? Is it more of a difficulty breathing? You know, to, to sort of tease out which of those two problems you think you want to deal with first, because clearly stenting open a trachea that's really not contributing to those clinical signs is not a good use of money. Um, and treating that in a dog that had pulmonary fibrosis is not going to make him feel any better. Um, and so, you know, looking at that and looking at this, this enlarged pulmonary artery, which I think is an important finding in this particular patient, you know, could it just be an allergic bronchitis? I think we thought it's possible, but given he's a Westie, I would absolutely have that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis on the list. And then you have to think about how am I going to answer that question. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you I don't know, but since it says idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, I'm going to bet nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know what the instigating cause is or whether they figured that out. Again, I, I think probably the internist can answer that better than I can, but I'm, I don't believe it's actually treatable. I don't know that you can stop. By the time we see them in their clinical, I'm not sure that you can stop the progression and you certainly can't reverse it. So they're not going to be any better than they are the day that they're diagnosed with that. Right. So again, it's, you know, when I, I look at a case like this, I didn't tell you about my kitty cat. My kitty cat, when I was in, in Cornell in my residency, had a diffuse bronchial pattern, and I said, okay, it's either can metastatic cancer from her mammary tumor that was diagnosed three years previously, or it's asthma. Well, the only thing I can treat is asthma, so you, you treat that, right? And then, so in this case, if I'm looking at the differentials being maybe a bronchitis or an allergic bronch airway disease versus idiopathic fibrosis, I'm probably not going to treat them a whole lot differently. Um, I would go look that up in a book, so please don't take that to the bank right now. But I, you're probably not going to treat that a whole lot differently, which means I treat what I can and see how they respond. Um, versus, really, the, we, we did talk about it, the diagnostic would be biopsy was the best we could come up with, because you're not going to get fibrosis on a lung wash. You're going to need a biopsy, and there are risks associated with that. So, um, and if you can't treat it, is that a risk you want to take? Questions right. on that one? Before we move on to our last one here, case six. Okay, so the last one is um, a little, oh, let's watch, watch this on YouTube there. That's not a good idea. 
Um, the last one, the, the online thing gave me a little grief today. So the ones I put in there were the ones that I could get when I first got online, and then I found the second one when I tried again later, and it stopped giving me error messages. So the, the radiographs you have in the package were when this cat had the foreign body the last time. And this one is with this history. Uh, so this is now. So it's a six year, uh, 10 year old fem spade female domestic long hair. So I had a previous history of foreign bodies. So the radiographs we have in the handout are of a nice foreign body or multiple foreign bodies, we think. Um, has some chronic gastritis issues, chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic atrophy. So recently presented with one week history or vomiting one week prior, half a kilogram of weight loss, otherwise good appetite and further vomiting. I don't know if that's further vomiting or no further vomiting. Uh, physical exam, two symmetrical smooth masses in the region of the thyroid glands. T4 is pending. All right, so you guys won't have these radiographs, but. And I think the main question was about enteritis, right? Right, so concern about enteritis. So mainly looking at the small bowel, so starting in the stomach, is there some sort of pointer I can use again? Okay, but don't break this one. I'll try not to. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so starting in the stomach, so we can see a little bit of the liver, a little bit of it was collimated off here, starting in our stomach, spans maybe one to two intercostal spaces, has some heterogeneous material in it, could just be ingesta. Forget, was the patient eating? Anybody know? They probably left. <laughs> Possibly. Well, some vomiting. Oh, otherwise good appetite. Okay, so patients seems to be eating. So it's not surprising that the stomach does have this heterogeneous appearance. It's not predominantly gas. It's not predominantly fluid. It's a mixture of the two. Probably has some kibble in it. Doesn't extend beyond the costal arch, so it's not dilated or distended. We can trace our colon. So like I said, I start at the stomach, find that, find our colon. So our descending colon has feces in it. You can follow it up to probably here, it takes a little loop, something like that. So that's gonna be our colon. Everything else in that abdomen is gonna be small bowel. So try, trace the stomach, trace the colon, everything else, small bowel. Now we wanna assess the width of that small bowel. In a cat, I use measurement of normal is less than 11 millimeters. In diameter, if we measure that, um, looking at them as a whole, they all seem to have the same uh, width, if you will. Um, so there's no focal dilation. I'm not suspecting a foreign body, nothing. There's no focal foreign body sitting here, or focal distension of the bowel. Um, and all the bowel has the same width basically all throughout. There is a fair amount of gas in here. Um, which is a little bit atypical for a cat. Most cats are either empty or they have a little bit of fluid, but you normally don't see this much gas. So this could be seen with some sort of enteropathy, um, unlikely a foreign body. We can see that serosal detail really well, so there's no indication for uh, peritoneal effusion. Um, I think that was about it for the GI. So our main thought on this was that this could potentially be an enteritis. Um, obviously we can't tell radiographically, but just based on that volume of gas, um, it could be seen with something like inflammatory bowel disease or um, food allergy or other enteritis, infectious or not. Um, I think that was our main concern. We did uh, um, discuss we briefly, you know, the challenges associated with looking at wall thickness with radiographs, right? The, the textbook would always tell you never assess small intestinal wall thickness on a radiograph because you don't know how much fluid is in the lumen. And so if you get a small gas cap, the mole might look artificially thicker. So the textbook always says that. I don't actually know that the textbook's right um, because having seen a lot of abdominal CTs, I don't know if you have a perspective on that, but I've never seen that. That drawing in the textbook that shows the intestinal loop, three quarters of the way full of fluid and a little gas cap on the top, I have never seen that on a CT. So, so I actually don't know that that ever happened and I would question whether maybe you could say that those were thick, but the book would say no, you can't. 
in the end, I'm not sure calling it thick on this versus not makes any difference to what I would say would be the most likely diagnosis. So. Are, are the tumors normal on that x-ray? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Not entirely sure what's going on here, but you'll notice how thick the distal third of those femurs are compared to the proximal half or proximal third. Um, I forget how old this cat was. What was a cat? Ten, Ten older cat. Um, I think we had some comments on his spine, didn't we? Too? No. Yeah, he's got some disc narrowing. His this was his previous study. He's got a lot more spondylosis on his current study and some disc narrowing here. So the spine does bend a little bit unusually. So we're wondering if he potentially had some previous uh, fractures in his femurs that had healed. Or metabolic bone disease and some folding fractures when he was young that just healed, I don't know. They look very benign at this mm -hmm. point, but. Cortices are nice and smooth. There's Those no fractures I noticed them on the original too, that there was something not quite right. And his tibias are a little bit unusual here, yeah. but we don't get a full look at them. I think that's about it for this guy. Questions? Concerns? Uh, this would fit with just a nonspecific enteropathy. You'd need to do something else to figure out what it is whether it be an exploratory, uh, exploratory laparotomy and take some intestinal biopsies. And I think if the big question is, he's asymptomatic. So yeah. how aggressive do you get right. in sure. an asymptomatic cat? Do you say he's clinically doing well? Let's assume it's inflammatory bowel disease. I know there's this big debate over, does inflammatory bowel disease ever malignantly transform into lymphoma? And I don't know that anybody's answered that. I've asked the internist many times over. And I'm not sure anybody's proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, I, think th I think that we have cats that are being treated for lymphoma that are now GI lymphoma that are six and seven years out that I am quite confident never had lymphoma, that they have had a nice long treatment for their inflammatory bowel disease because the prognosis isn't that good if it's true lymphoma. So um, I think when they're asymptomatic, you have to make a judgment call and again inform the client of your options to go forward diagnostically or whether they want to treat symptomatically given that there's none that's challenging. Um, but that's, again, that's where the art of now, now all bets are off because you've got a client to deal with and what they want to do. Or is this completely normal? Did we stress the cat out bringing him into the clinic? Was he breathing, panting a little bit more, swallowed a little bit more air, which normally occurs in dogs, but can occur in right. cats too. So he swallows a lot more air. He's been in your clinic for an hour. You take him on the table, you slam him down. Not gently, of course. Slam and then he's got a large down. amount of gas in his small bowel. So it's not a really specific finding. It could still be normal. So it could have just been an aerophagic stressed out cat, which I've seen before. They just have normal gas. We go to ultrasound their GI tract and it's completely normal wall thickness. I was gonna show you so. mine, but I don't have the stressed out rads <laughs> on there, but he was pretty aerophagic when he came in. <laughs> and it can be a lot more noticeable where every tube is filled with gas and the stomach is descended with gas. Um, I might, if a case was like that, a cat with everything gas distended, I'd be more concerned about some sort of respiratory issue, a pharyngeal foreign body, something obstructing his airway that he's actually swallowing a lot more air, but. So there's one last question of could it be a linear foreign body? Could it be a linear foreign body? So the thing that we look for for linear foreign bodies, we look at the gas bubbles and the gas patterns, and what we're looking for is nice round gas bubbles. Um, so if you have gas in a segment of fluid, it's going to be nice and round. You're going to have a nice either ovoid or spherical gas bubble. Once you get a linear foreign body, so the first thing that's going to happen is your intestines are going to bunch together. So in this case, let's say they're nicely spread out. They go from the liver all the way to the urinary bladder. And if you look at each, almost every one of those bowel, uh, gas bubbles in the small bowel, they have a nice curvy, uh, curved margin to it. None of them are comma-shaped. They don't have a nice sharp peak to it, and none of them are squared off or have a uh, very unusual geometric shape. That would be more consistent with a linear form body. Any other questions? All right, well, okay. thank you again thank for you. sticking it out to this wee hour. Did you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> thank you.
Thanks to my team. <laughs> Thanks, guys.